Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen demands I have a baby for her. My oldest sister is 40. She always wanted to be a mom, but some complications meant she was never able to be a biological mom. In her 20s, she met a widower with kids and married him, admitting her intention was to become a mom through them. Her stepkids were never okay with her like that, and for the last 16 years, she has struggled to come to terms with the fact that not one of them even considers her their mom or embraces her like she would like them to. This is something she always complains about when she's around our family, especially me and our sisters. Three years ago, one of my sisters was expecting her third kid and she was going through a lot and struggling with her pregnancy. She wasn't sure they could handle a third kid and worried about financials because her husband had a new job that paid less than his old one. The old one folded a few months before that and they had already made adjustments to factor in the new household budget. My oldest sister harassed her for months about letting her adopt the baby, going as far as going to our brother-in-law about it and telling him she wanted the baby and he should talk our sister into it. It never happened, but it did harm her relationship with the rest of the family. I gave birth to my second kid in November and had a procedure to make sure I had no more kids. Both my pregnancies have been awful on my body and I didn't want to risk putting myself through that again. My sister brought this up last week. She said I was selfish to sterilize myself before offering to be a surrogate for her and that I could have given her my youngest to adopt at the very least. I told her I wanted my kids, so I would never give one up like that. She said her dreams of motherhood were important. I told her nobody owed her motherhood though and the way she was carrying on was wrong and concerning and she had brushed aside our concerns before, but she needed to get some help because she can't keep demanding others give her their kids. She flipped out and started screaming that as her family, we should want to help her reach her dream of motherhood and we should be more understanding because she gets crap from her stepkids and doesn't get any of the joy the rest of us have. We've been sensitive for years. We encouraged her to speak to someone countless times, but she keeps going on like this and it's concerning. Her marriage has felt the strain of it all, but I know I might have been harsh saying we didn't owe her motherhood, which is why I'm here. Am I the jerk? I get that being a parent, especially a mother in this case, is important to some people and to not fulfill that dream is something to genuinely grieve. However, after being raised by people who felt that they were owed kids, it caused a lot of generational issues for us. We weren't seen as people as much as toys to show off and as with most toys, we continued to lose value over time when we were no longer new. Honestly, the way she's acting is making me grateful she can't have kids. I can only imagine the pressure, codependency, and general issues a kid would face with her attitude. My mom wasn't nearly this bad, but I still essentially was her parent, and guess who I no longer talk to? Wow. First off, your sister needs a lot of help. She is obsessed with having kids, and she's turning into someone most people wouldn't even want to be around. She needs therapy, and quite possibly medication. Second, not the jerk. You actually put it very well. Nobody is owed motherhood and your sister is wrong to expect others to hand it to her. Your words were a bit blunt, but I have the feeling you have tried to be nice about the whole thing for a long time, and the comment about you being a surrogate for her was the last straw. It's not up to you to make her a mom. Good luck to your family, particularly her husband. Am I the jerk for not telling my cousin my fiancé works at the same office as her husband? I have a cousin, Kat, who got married to Henry early this year. We weren't close as kids, she was pretty spoiled and would always brag about how much designer stuff she has, be really mean to people under the guise of just trying to help, etc. Don't go out of our way to interact with one another, but I do see her at family events and whatnot, and we do make small talk. I'm engaged to Chris, who's a software engineer. He's co-head of his department at work with two other people. Not too long ago, Chris was telling me about how they had some new employees, and one of them sounded really familiar. He told me the name, and I realized it was Kat's husband. Also, he and Henry hadn't met face to face yet. Kat and Henry had a huge wedding. It was really nice, but all she did for months was brag about how amazing her wedding was. 
The wedding stuff's died down now, so recently she started going on about how wealthy her husband is and what a great lifestyle they have. One of my other aunts celebrated her 50th about a week ago. I went with Chris and Kat was there with Henry. We were chatting and Kat was saying how Henry has a fantastic new job that pays even more than his previous one. Henry chimed in and said that they were already planning to buy a new house. Kat asked what Chris does. I said he was an engineer like Henry and he has a good job too, but I'll admit I left out where he works on purpose. She smiled and nodded, then said it's fine. She understands that I'm embarrassed and wants to keep it quiet. So that was pretty much the end of our conversation then. When we were leaving, she pulled me aside and told me to let her and Henry know if we needed help with the wedding. Obviously, I knew what she meant and it was just another dig, but I said bye and left. Literally two days later, I get a DM from Kat and she's furious, well, as much as one can be through text, that I didn't tell them that Chris was one of Henry's bosses. Henry was shocked to see him in the office and Chris made a comment, tell Kat, OP and me don't need help, but thanks for offering. Henry's really embarrassed and so is Kat, and she said that we made them look bad on purpose, and if she knew, she'd never have made those comments. It was my duty to tell her and Henry. Chris and I had a really good laugh over this, but she sent a text out to our family group chat we have saying how she was blindsided by me. A few others said what we did was petty and wrong. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk, and I love the way you handled it. It was better than the way I would have handled it, which would have been to publicly and loudly ask her husband how he liked working for my husband. But I have a habit of making things worse. It's not my best trait. I wonder why Henry didn't recognize Chris at the family function. I'd notice if my boss was somewhere, even if there were like 200 or more attendees. Or is Henry so junior an engineer that he hasn't even met the heads of the department? OP. They hadn't met face to face yet. Chris is a co-head and Henry's mainly been dealing with one of the other bosses so far. Not the jerk. Kat is embarrassed and also annoyed she can't brag and one-up you, so she's telling you off as a way to clamor back power on you. Stand your ground and don't apologize. You can say, I understand you're embarrassed, but I didn't do anything wrong. If you didn't talk down to people, this would never be an issue. Ignore all the whining and people she enlists to complain on her behalf. They are all wrong. Am I the jerk for taking a DNA test? My mother and I have a low contact relationship for a host of reasons, so for me, this wasn't a thing to worry about, but maybe I'm wrong. When I was a kid, she refused to tell me who my biological father was or to tell me why she wouldn't tell me. My aunt P, her elder sister, told me when I was 18 that my father was a bad person. At the time, I accepted that as an answer since my mother has always, despite claiming to love me to my stepdad and his family, made it clear how much she didn't want me around. But my mother lied about things, not just major things, mundane things like who made a dish. Fast forward a couple of decades and this topic came up again at a family function because my stepdad's sister M has never liked my mom and since M was never told the story my mother's side of the family was told, she was under the impression that I was to be told who he was once I was an adult. She asked about it and when I told her I didn't know, she confronted my mother who gave me a name, Tom Smith, and the school he went to in the 70s. It wasn't exactly the kind of info that helps you find anyone, so last year I took one of those corporate DNA tests. I didn't expect much, but I wanted to know if I had any half-siblings. I found a whole family this year, definitely not named Smith, including my deceased father's siblings. His name and other info doesn't match anything my mother told me, but DNA doesn't lie. My mother is remembered by them as the other woman, who, when my father refused to leave his wife, my mother told him she wasn't going to have me. Shortly after that argument, he passed in an accident. I look just like him and his twin sister T, who has a picture of him with my mother as well as his journal, which I'm still reading, but it pretty much details what sounds like a swinger couple figuring out that what they were doing was fun, but maybe too risky. Now I know the real reason things were the way they are, and for right now, that's enough for me. I'm still processing, especially since my mother has presented herself as a hyper-conservative Catholic for most of my life. But my new aunt is angry because she worked at the same company with my mother about 15 years ago and my mother never told her I existed. She called my parents' house, they still have a listed landline and my mother's first name is very unique, and left a long, angry message on the voicemail that my stepdad heard. Apparently, there were a lot of lies told to him about my mother's life before they got together and during their marriage. Now she's angry with me for causing problems and I am definitely not feeling guilty. 
However, my aunt says I should have just left it alone after all of this. My aunt says I should have just left it alone after all this time. So, am I the jerk for wanting to know my father's identity and inadvertently outing her past as the other woman? Not the jerk. If she had been open with you, you might never have gone looking. You had a right to know about your background. It's hard to even imagine being in such a situation. Who wouldn't want to know their own background? Not the jerk. From your post, it sounds like you are a full adult, so you have the right to know who your father is. Other people in your life made a choice to hide who he was from you, and that made you curious. Not the jerk. Your mother's relationship with your father's family is not something she gets to manage on your behalf now that you're a grown adult, and her relationship with your stepfather is not your responsibility to manage for her. Her lies and failure to think through the possible long-term consequences of anything here are why things are so messy now. And she knew darn well there was no neat way out of any of this, or she wouldn't have tried so hard to put off the inevitable drama. None of that is on you. Forget everything about this place? A malicious compliance over a decade in the making. Many years ago, I worked for a little company. CEO was a jerk of the first order. We needed image hosting for a large client account, and CEO was unwilling to pay for maybe two to $3,000 in annual image hosting fees at the time, even though the company made millions off of the deal. Me being an enterprising individual, I figured out a way to host the images on Flickr. I saved the login information in a physical notebook and kept informing them that this is a house of cards and we really need to switch to a professional service. Several months later, I was promoted and asked for a raise to go along with my promotion. CEO said no. All promotions and raises required CEO sign-off. I tried negotiating, but CEO said no and to leave if I didn't like it. So I left. CEO told me to forget everything related to the job here and he'd sue me if I did anything with the client accounts afterwards, such as sabotage or steal clients. I told him I'm leaving all my knowledge behind in the notebook and my final email to him. My manager and BCC, my personal email. In this email, a full inventory of what I left behind, invoices, contracts, etc., including this entry. Personal notebook, account notes and reference material, including image hosting logins for blank accounts, keep for reference. Recently, I received a professional networking site message from CEO telling me to help them with my old accounts or he'd sue me. Apparently, Flickr changed their terms of service and the images were deleted. In over 10 years, nobody updated any documentation or the image hosting. Nobody bothered checking the email account either. That was used to log into Flickr account. I told him that I could not help. Per his request, I forgot everything I knew about his company and anything I knew was in that notebook I left him over 10 years ago. Seriously though, I don't remember what I had for breakfast. Technical details from that long ago, I just laugh. Am I the jerk for confronting my brother's friend about boundaries and embarrassing him in front of my family? I'm 18, female. My little brother and his friend, who are both 13, are really close. You never see one without the other. In fact, his friend practically lives with us now because he prefers being around our family. At first, we weren't opposed to having him around all the time. He's a good kid, but he gradually became more clingy and rude these past few months. Now he gets upset when the two aren't together 24 seven to the point where he'll get fidgety when my brother leaves him alone for more than a day. And when my brother spends time with people other than him, he'll shut down and go quiet until the other friends are gone. One time he switched it up and went too far by bullying one of my brother's friends. He teased her relentlessly and stole her hat, refusing to give it back. Our mom had to intervene and the girl left early. He used to be really nice to my brother, always being supportive and putting him first, but now he resorts to making fun of him with sarcastic comments that are very humorless and cruel. My brother's spoken up about how his friend's change in behavior makes him uncomfortable and wishes he'd stop acting strange. Yesterday, I overheard the two of them talking and everything that came out of his friend's mouth was a mean jab at my brother's expense. This was the last straw for me, so I pulled his friend aside and told him his obsession with my brother is unhealthy and he needs to stop acting this way and start respecting my brother's boundaries or he won't be allowed to step foot in our house again. This is where I feel like I might be the jerk. He clearly wasn't expecting to be told off like that. He looked around the room at everyone staring at him, obviously embarrassed, and his eyes began to water. He said sorry, then walked out the front door. I feel bad for making him cry but I don't regret embarrassing him in front of my family. It seemed to get the point across effectively because today he hasn't said anything mean or negative towards my brother. My brother thanked me for intervening, 
but says I should have told him off in private instead of humiliating him like that. My parents also think I could have handled it better. So, am I the jerk here? You stood up for your brother when the need arose. Calling someone out on their behavior is far more effective when you do it immediately. While in some ways it's unfortunate that it happened with other people around, it sounds like the kid needed to learn his lesson, and it's more important that your brother saw you standing up for him. Getting the timing wrong doesn't make you a jerk. You did exactly what a big sister should do. Edit. As the big sister, you probably have a place of respect in the friend's eyes. Being told off by you would really sting. That also puts you in a position to positively reinforce good behavior. It's worth spending a bit of time with them both within those boundaries you've reminded the friend of. It only worked because other people were around. When he looked around that room and saw that nobody disagreed with what OP said, he had no choice but to listen. Not the jerk, because your brother did need someone to stick up for him, but you probably could have handled it better. Remember that this is a kid. There seem to be some red flags here. The friend prefers to stay with your family and seems very insecure about keeping your brother as his friend. That kind of behavior doesn't come out of nowhere. Do you know anything about his home life? Well, what do you think? Is Opie the jerk for how she treated her little brother's friend or not? Please let us know. No, I think she rocks. Sometimes bullies get what's coming to them. Am I the jerk for giving false info to my boss's spy he put in my work crew, which resulted in him getting fired? Hello all, I hope you're doing well. So I had been having issues with a coworker for well over a month and my boss refused to do anything. I can't get into specifics because of the rules of this subreddit, but let's just say anywhere else he would have been fired the first day I said something. Well, I went above my boss to his boss to get it settled after texting my boss every single day for him to come talk to him or to do something. My boss's boss handled it that same night, and honestly, I didn't want him fired, I just wanted the issues to stop. Well, my boss took things personally and chewed me out for well over 30 minutes on me going above his head. Well, after the other guy was let go, my boss added someone else to work with us and said to me that he knows this guy is solid, so if there are any problems, then he knows I'm the one causing issues. Well, that was red flag number one with this guy. Red flag number two was when he said, I'm not into drama, but your coworker was a nice guy and you had no right to go above boss's head to get him fired. The final red flag was when our boss's boss just showed up randomly to chat with me because the principal of the school I work at asked him to come talk to me because my work tripled and I wasn't able to keep up. Well, this new guy said his phone was shut off, but all of a sudden, as soon as he heard that the big boss was here, he had to leave to make a phone call. So now on to what false info I gave him. So I get to work about 20 to 30 minutes early every day and I used to just clock in and work till the end of my 8 hour shift and that ticked off my boss so I stopped doing it. Well after the new guy got back from his phone call, he wanted to know when we clocked in. So I lied and told him I clocked in 30 minutes early and that I'm out of here in an hour. Well the new guy got another phone call all of a sudden even though his phone was shut off and he left. I know now that he was talking to our boss because our boss showed up exactly one hour later and said I need to talk to you. He proceeded to tell me that I knew not to clock in early and that I had been warned not to do that. I told him to look at my time card and sure enough I clocked in right on time. I thanked him for giving me an excuse to contact his boss again and went back to work for my final 15 minutes and the new guy was let go for lying to our boss. Am I the jerk in this situation? Not the jerk. You didn't get him fired. You didn't lie about him, you lied about you. He exposed himself by reporting you and your management fired him. It seems like they're all completely out of line. It's probably time to look for another job. He was mostly hired to find a reason to get OP fired. Too bad that OP isn't stupid. Not the jerk. And the problem here is your immediate supervisor. Don't know what's going on with him, but the fact that he didn't address the situation with the previous man and then sent a spy in to try and catch you out so he could fire you, that's a huge red flag. OP, I know, and I'm looking for other employment. Tried to quit. So, dear readers, for those that don't know, I was a front desk agent at a short yard by Harriet. Key word being was. A few weeks ago, I finally decided I'd had enough. New GM was moving in, and my AGM, who started at the same time as me, was moving on. I was completely burned out on customer service. It's been a tough couple years to be in the hospitality industry. Long hours, getting called in on days off, People not knowing how to behave, I'm exhausted. I put in my notice the day before my weekend, ready to be done. The next day, I get a call pretty early in the morning. I answered, thinking it's one of the places I've applied for. I have literally over a dozen interviews set up for the next couple days, 
so I wasn't worried about finding something. But it's not any of them. It's the director of sales at my current place of work. She asks if I'm really leaving and then says they don't want to lose me. I'm the top associate when it comes to Bonvoy signups and new sales leads, plus I know the front desk inside and out. I told her I was burned out on front desk and I wasn't going to stay. She tells me that I don't need to stay at the front desk. They're hiring a sales coordinator. Better pay, 9 to 5 hours, I get my own desk. I don't have to wear the god-awful short yard uniform. I told her I'd think about it and let her know. When I next go into work, I'm talking it over with some of my coworkers. What do I find out? The head chef, who's worked basically every position in the hotel and knows it better than anyone, he kept things running during lockdown, has been offered the AGM position. Over the moon is an understatement for how I was feeling. The new GM, who I had been iffy about, calls me into his office and tells me that they don't want to lose talent. He really wants me to stay. So here we are, dear readers. I get to stay at a property I love with a team I love, but I'm officially done at the front desk on Monday. I still have stories to post, and I'm sure this new position will have plenty of interesting tales. On to the next adventure. My Karen mother moves in with me, chaos ensues. At the beginning of lockdowns here in Germany, my mother came to me saying I should let her live with me in my house because, wait for it, I am your mother. Well, I let her move into the granny apartment. It has a separate entrance and has one bedroom, one bathroom, a kitchen slash dining room and living room. While she slept in the bedroom in the apartment, she used the main kitchen to cook her meals, but refused to cook shared meals, used the main living room to watch TV, basically acted as if she owned the house. Any of my complaints she likewise dismissed, I am your mother. It all came to a head when I was working on a computer in the living room. There was a lull while the system setup was doing its thing, so I went to the kitchen to brew tea and have a snack. During this time, my mother went into the living room to watch TV, but I had been listening to Vivaldi's Four Seasons, so she started pulling power plugs in an attempt to shut off the music. One of the first plugs she pulled was of course the computer I had been working on. When I came back to the kitchen, she rejected any fault for it. According to her, it was clearly my fault because she had to shut off the music to watch TV. So why would she feel free to shut off my music in my house? Not to mention that I had to start over the system setup. Well, because I am your mother. I countered, and my mother is a guest in my house, so until you behave like a guest, you better go to your apartment. She didn't like being treated like that one bit. Well, she went to her apartment, then left. I went to a hardware store and bought some new locks. Until then, the keys for the main door also worked for the apartment door and vice versa. The inside door connecting the apartment and the main house didn't have a lock at all. So yes, I locked her out of the main part of the house. And then the phone calls started. First, my brother, to whom I suggested he take her in. The house he lives in alone is even larger than mine. Then my older sister, who has two spare rooms in her and her husband's condo since her kids moved out long ago, and who didn't like the suggestion she should take our mother in either. My sister's daughter was somewhat surprised when I explained to her that the house belongs to me and not to her grandmother. Her brother only called to get my confirmation about that. My brother's son was actually on my side, but warned me about my mother planning something. So a few days later, while running errands, I got a call from the hardware store from which I bought the new locks. They told me that the police had called them to send someone to open the house. What had my mother done? She called the police for help because her son had locked her out of her house. When the officers at my house confronted me with that, I simply told them to try her key at the door on the side. Obviously, they hadn't done that before. Then they wanted proof that it was actually I who owned the house. Oddly enough, the copies of the deed I had at home were nowhere to be found, so I called my attorney and he sent one of his partners with new copies. He also brought eviction papers telling me to consider it. I simply asked for a pin. A few days later, my mother moved in with my brother. Brother, older sister, and her husband helped her with her stuff. Brother made a last effort to make me change my mind. My sister merely treated me with contempt. Brother-in-law told me quietly he vetoed our mother moving in with them before my sister even made the suggestion. But this still isn't the end of it. 
The police officers are pressing charges for falsely reporting a crime, me locking her out. Everyone and their brother has called me to take back the charges. I hadn't pressed them in the first place. It's out of my hands to tell the police that it's all just a misunderstanding or at least put in a good word for her. Why? Of course, because she is your mother. Impatient Karen loses her job. For those not in the know, a mystery shopper is a person assigned by the company to make random, unannounced inspections with regards to customer service and in general, the well-being of the company employees and the store. Also, it is customary for these mystery shoppers to blend in with everyday customers and not bring attention to themselves in a way that can be misconstrued as just another obnoxious and rude customer, i.e. act like a jerk, get treated like a jerk. This lady didn't get that memo. One day around lunchtime, my boss was in the back having her lunch. I was out on the shop floor and serving customers, an unusually high amount, but nothing that I couldn't handle on my own since my coworker wasn't going to be in later. Then in walks Karen. As I was serving the queue of customers, I half-heartedly said, Hi, welcome to... I was hungry while still serving and ringing through items. Karen. <laughs> And under her breath, it's polite to make eye contact. Alarm bells. She hums and haws while I'm making my way cautiously and correctly through the remaining customers. All the while, she's making daggers and eventually storms off in a huff looking around. Like I can come away from paying customers just to help her. As the last two customers make their way to the till, she joins the queue with a whole two items with an audible, Oh, for goodness sake. The customer I'm serving looks at me with a what the heck expression and I nod. Not even one minute in. This is ridiculous. Finalizing the payment before moving on to the next customer, the till decides to freeze and it takes a few minutes for it to reboot. I make my apologies and the customer I'm serving is fine with it along with the customer behind. Louder Karen. Oh for goodness sake, the service in this establishment. She was posh is absolutely ridiculous. I had enough. With my best, but upset, customer service voice and smile, I said, me. Listen, as you can clearly see, I am dealing with other customers. I am the only staff member on the floor as my boss is at lunch. The till has decided to not play nice, and to be perfectly honest with you, I am well within my rights to refuse you service and ask you to leave as your attitude absolutely stinks. Karen, what? You can't talk to me that way. Don't you know who I am? Me. I really don't care to be honest. Now I am once again asking you to leave. She storms off in the foulest mood you've ever seen. The customer I am serving says, Thank goodness you said something. I was ready to lose it on her. We both laugh and I finish both services and thank them for their patience. They both worked in another store where we were based. My boss has finally finished her lunch at this point and has come through the front. Boss. Oh, I meant to say there's going to be a mystery shopper in at some point. Don't know who, but please be on your best behavior. Oh my. I quickly tell her what happened and explain that I was busy, but not too busy that I needed her and the conversations as it happened. And lo and behold, just as I'm finished telling her, in walks the regional manager for the company. Regional manager. OP, back office, now. I'm done for. Now, knowing that the RM has a tendency to be a hothead in these situations, I was really nervous at this point. Thankfully, I've had a reasonably good working relationship with him up until this point, so it really could go anyway. Regional manager, unusually calm. What happened? I explain everything, from the moment she entered to the moment she stormed off, almost taking the door with her and the fact that I had witnesses that worked in the immediate vicinity. The full shebang. Regional manager sighs and nods. I'm finally glad that someone else has the courage to stand up to my wife. What? The look on my face said it all and he starts to laugh. Please accept my apologies and I will let your boss know that there's not to be any repercussions for this. And I think it's time to let my wife know it's time to find more suitable employment. Me, speechless, and mutters, Th thanks. He hands me a 20-pound gift card for the mall's cafe and said lunch was on him.
The best coffee and chicken bacon club sandwich I ever had. Am I the jerk for no longer letting my mother-in-law watch my daughter after she kept throwing away the food I sent? I'm a widower and have a six-year-old daughter who's a very picky eater and got worse after her mother's passing. She loved her mother's cooking and refused to eat anything that isn't made by her mother. I decided to learn to cook her favorite meals that my wife used to cook and my daughter has been loving my version of her mother's cooking. I recently started working a new job and my mother-in-law started watching my daughter three days a week. I have my sister helping, so I'm doing good. I prepare meals for my daughter to take with her to grandparents' house so my mother-in-law won't have to worry about what my daughter can and cannot eat. My mother-in-law complained about the meals I sent and said I needed to encourage my daughter to eat from a variety of dishes. I already explained how my daughter is when it comes to food and that I'm already learning new dishes every week, so it's not repetitive. So last week, I discovered that my daughter has been eating only snacks for days at her grandparents' house. She told me this and I was confused. I asked about the meals I send with her and she said that her grandma would take them from her hand once I leave, throw them in the trash can, then tell her to eat dishes she makes. My daughter refused and has been only eating snacks at that house. I was enraged. I confronted my mother-in-law and she said that she didn't find that me sending meals with my daughter was the right thing to do and wanted her granddaughter to eat her cooking and was upset that she refused. She said it's my fault her granddaughter doesn't want to eat certain foods and that I was spoiling her rotten with this behavior. I mentioned to her that the meals she threw away were my wife's recipes and that I struggle so hard to provide those meals, as well as taking time to learn to cook them. She stated I wasn't doing a good job parenting and needed to get a grip because she's feeling concerned about how spoiled my daughter is being because of me. Eventually, I told her that I won't let her watch my daughter from now on and decided to ask my sister for help. Father-in-law and sister-in-law kept on calling me cruel for not letting them see their granddaughter and father-in-law said that I was overreacting and promised to convince his wife to let my daughter eat what she wants as long as she visits, but I refuse to discuss it because right now, I really don't take what they say at face value. Neighbor won't stay out of our yard and lets his dog use it as a bathroom. We purchased our home a couple of years ago. It's 45 years old and we have a pretty big front yard that wraps around on both sides to a backyard with woods. The neighbors on either side of us have fully fenced in, boxed in yards with tall wooden gates. Our yard is open and we're currently in the process of building a fence on the sides so that our dog has a space to run free. We have a 10 month old German Shepherd Boxer Mix puppy. She's sweet, picking up training and does well outside when we take her on walks. And when she is outside, we put her in the backyard on a long, heavy duty lead that's anchored so she can run around until this fence is complete. The neighborhood is full of dogs. Everyone seems courteous and picks up after their own, with the exception of our direct next door neighbor. He lets his two dogs free roam. Everyone thinks it's so cute. They apparently don't believe in leashes. While I'm impressed that his dogs are so well trained, what I'm completely upset about is that he lets his two dogs come into our yard multiple times a day while he's working outside and they use it as their toilet. He jokes with me about it, saying, Oh, the dogs must like you guys, etc. The problem is, and I've addressed it with him directly in person and also indirectly with snide comments already, he lets them wander all over the place and they keep going to the bathroom in both our front, back, and side yards. He knows that they're doing it because he's up on his ladder trimming his trees and isn't oblivious to seeing what they're doing. His yard is immaculate with a sprinkler system and it's very, very well manicured, so I know he isn't clueless about the value of a nice space and picking up dog dew. When we walk our dog, I always pick up after her. I bring bags with us and I don't let her go in other people's yards, period. I think it's rude to assume that because someone has grass, your dog should be able to use it as a toilet. Some people won't agree, but we have taught ours to go on the road and we just pick it up afterwards. I feel like this is a common courtesy. The issue now has become that our dog will be minding her own business in the backyard and suddenly the free roaming dogs just show up, startling her and she gets very territorial and wants to go after them because they came into our yard ready to fight. Not only is it her nature to protect us, but she knows her property now and that this is her space they're coming into. Yesterday, our dog was barking like crazy in the entryway. 
She wouldn't stop and kept peeking out of the glass in the door. So I look outside and not only are there two dogs playing in our front yard with a ball, but the neighbor is out there in our yard, right smack dab in the middle, just running around and chasing them like he's at a dog park or something. A few moments later, I see that the guy across the street has let his dog out, and now he is also standing in our yard, just chatting it up and playing with all the dogs. This isn't a city park. Are you kidding me? Our front yard is probably one eighth to a quarter of an acre, and the back and sides are another quarter of an acre. It isn't hard to decipher that this is our front yard, it doesn't butt up to any other public space. It's an older cul-de-sac and we just so happen to have the broadest, widest areas of space out in front of the house, while other neighbors have larger backyards instead. The street comes to an end and our yard is there along with our driveway next to it. It's very clear that this isn't their home. So I opened the door yesterday while these jerks were hanging out in my yard, dog barking like Cujo, holding her back with her harness, and I said, look, you guys need to get off of our property. This isn't a park. Our dog is very territorial, and one of these days she's going to go after someone or someone's dog if you guys don't stop letting your dogs roam. They just stood there like I was the issue, just a jerk with an attitude. So my husband went outside and he chatted with them as well. Explained that she's a puppy, we are obviously building a fence, pieces of it are up. He said he's concerned that one of their dogs will get bit if they just wander into our yard because our dog will get startled and defend her territory. So what are my options here? Aside from becoming a no trespassing sign psychopath and sticking them up everywhere, what do we do? Obviously we care about all the dogs and don't want anyone getting hurt, which is our first concern. But these people have zero care in the world about just wandering into our yard and using it as their own space. What gives? This makes me want to go look back at our camera footage to see if they've been doing this all along and nobody has said anything to them. These same men go into our neighborhood group on Facebook and regularly post about people speeding, about picking up trash, and minding noise levels, etc. We don't have an HOA, so I feel we are at the mercy of these self-righteous jerks who think they own the neighborhood. Today, the dog was barking again, and lo and behold, the man and his dog are back in our yard again. Who behaves this way? Put in sprinklers, even a cheap movable one, and turn it on every time the people show up in the yard. I'm honestly annoyed for you. I would be livid. Get them charged for trespassing. Why bother saving a relationship with people who don't even respect your literal and figurative boundaries? Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you try to get them to stop or not? Please let us know. Oh, I'd know how to get him to stop all right. But trust me, you really don't want to know how. Am I the jerk for giving my dad his money back in front of his other kids and telling him he was no longer welcome at my graduation? My graduation ceremony is being held next week. My dad has given me some money in advance to pay for the party. I live mostly with my mom, but they were supposed to be hosting the event together. Dad and I have a rocky relationship. After my parents divorced when I was four, they split custody of me and he was able to stay a good dad. When I was 10, he met Jane. Jane had three kids, twins and a single kid. They got married when I was 12, but I would say even before that, I felt like he prioritized her kids over me a lot. He would cancel plans with me if they wanted to do something, and would either do the thing with them or force me to go and say it was even better than our plans, when for me it wasn't. Think going for a hike with me versus taking them to an indoor play area, or seeing a movie with me versus the kiddie park. One more example is when I was given a ticket for a concert my dad and I both love. He was supposed to buy a ticket to come with me for some father-son time, but actually spent it on his youngest stepkid who wanted their room painted. He told me at the last minute and it hurt. There are other times stuff like this happened too. He didn't show up at the hospital when I broke my arm because one stepkid was getting their tonsils out and wanted both him and his wife there. He told my mom over the phone to tell me he was proud of me for being brave and understanding even though I never said that. When I would bring this stuff up to tell him, he'd tell me it was natural to feel jealous of sharing his attention. That was all he would say. In 2019, he told my mom he would split the cost of a trip I wanted to go on with one of my clubs because she didn't have the money all by herself. Mom had her half saved. We told my dad he needed to pay. He said bills were tight and it was the twins' birthdays and the money needed to go on something for them. He told me we could do something as a family when the trip happened instead. I told him to forget it that he was making it clear who was more important and I was going to stay with my mom where I actually mattered. Mom borrowed money to cover the other half of the trip. 
Dad told me he regretted making me feel less important and we were working on things and then the graduation money was given about a month ago. Then a week ago, he called me and told me how one of the stepkids was being bullied, how bad of a time they're having and with that money, they could help cheer them up for their birthday. I was upset. I hung up. Then two days later, I showed up at his doorstep, gave him the money back and told him I didn't want to see him or his new family at my graduation and that he had chosen who was more important so he better stay out of my life. His stepkids and two younger biological kids were there. I didn't stick around. He called and told me we needed to talk it out like adults and that I had hurt the kids' feelings. His wife freaked out on me, so I blocked her. Am I the jerk? As a mom with kids from two marriages, I will say absolutely not the jerk. Your dad consistently and constantly chose everyone else above you. This is not okay. Making and breaking promises is disgusting. Saying one thing and then backing out is gross. And asking for the money back? No, just no. He is not a father. He's a spineless donor who deserves nothing from you. You needed a father and he was absolutely not it. And I'm sorry. I want to add, OP, his behavior has nothing to do with you. You are worth everything he failed to do and more. His behavior shows the person he is, always will, and always has. Also, his reply tells a lot. They need to talk like adults because OP hurt the kid's feelings? Really? After your kid told you that he wants you out of his life and wants nothing to do with you because you prioritize your new family over the old, this is what is on your mind? This man is useless and he doesn't care. Good riddance, he's not a father. This is what I would tell him. Call him by his first name and say, there's nothing left to discuss. At every moment, you have made it abundantly clear that your stepkids will always take priority over me. Every single decision you have made since they came into your life has proven this as a fact. Because of that, I no longer want to have a relationship with you. Moving forward, I will simply tell people that my father is no longer a part of my life. I was tempted to tell people why we no longer have a relationship because I think people should see you for who you really are. But I've come to the conclusion that I need to let go of the pain and resentment entirely and move forward in my life without the burden of your pain on my conscience. So I'm letting you go. Thank you for helping to bring me into this world. That was the first and only thing you ever did for me that truly mattered. But this is the end of our journey together. I can't count on you. You're never going to make me a priority in your life and I can't continue to be let down by you. You have a family now that I'm not part of. It's time we both accept that this is just the way things are and how they'll always be. I do apologize for confronting you in front of your kids. That was not my intention. You've been good to them and I know if the roles were reversed, I would be upset having heard what I said. But they know that you love them and in the end, this too shall pass. I wish we could have had what you had with them, but we don't always get what we want out of life. So be good to them and be the kind of father they deserve, not the kind of father you were to me. After sending this message, I will be blocking you on everything and asking mom to cease all contact with you. You will not be getting any updates, nor will you be hearing from me anymore. Please do not attempt to contact me ever again. Not the jerk. Deny my employee claim? I'll withdraw everything from your company and watch you disintegrate. I have a story that started back before lockdown and just concluded a while back. Obligatory first time poster and English is my third language, so forgive any errors I make on my use of words. I'm a typical simple guy who likes to relax and was born with the proverbial silver spoon in my mouth. I'm the black sheep of my family and a middle child to boot, double whammy. But I at least have some brains and some luck which I kind of use on a day-to-day -day basis. Due to my parents' connections, I managed to get into lucrative schools in my country, did my military service and was promoted upward to captain and later on was shipped off to college out of the country. I've never been too close with many people apart from my circle of friends and I prefer it that way. After my college, I was employed in government, you guessed it, family connections, and after a few years was able to use my name to get ahead and meet people who helped me set up several businesses in my area, a coastal city, where this story happens. The money I used was generally allowances, small inheritance from my late grandma, some investments, a fund that was started when I was a baby, and money gifted to me by family, basically an attempt to not leave me broke enough to embarrass them, even though I am a simple low-maintenance fellow. My businesses are booming since the coastal area we live in attracts a lot of tourists, local and international, and of course some locals who wish to mingle with the tourists to get green cards, pen pals, spouses and such. Typical coastal city, I guess. The Incident As a proprietor of my business, 
I have most, if not all of my staff on salary, since it's the best way for them to gain benefits and is easier for me as a business owner tax-wise. Tipping is more of a gift usually, since we do not have a tipping culture. And I have my staff on comprehensive medical insurance, which has additional dental and optical on top of the national government healthcare medical scheme. We also have a mandatory legal requirement to provide employees with retirement benefits, minimum of 21 working days leave, I give 30, and my businesses offer paid overtime, unhindered medical leave for surgery, and serious conditions which can be extended as well as allowances to seek treatment such as chemo or dialysis. One of my female employees, an older lady who was brilliant and had moved up the ranks to manager and was adored by all, was booked for a hysterectomy since, as she told me, she was at risk of cervical cancer as her mother had passed from it a few years back and since she already had four kids it was the most logical step. She did her due diligence and found a private hospital which was in our system where she could have the procedure done. On the planned date, she applied for leave days, which we obviously approved since this fell under the scope of medical leave. She went on to have the procedure successfully and had a quick recovery time. The bill was to be catered for by the company insurance and we had made sure to get all of the necessary pre-authorizations. A few months later, she came back to work looking distraught and in all honesty, we thought that she had been told that she had gotten cancer since she had asked for a day off to go for review and tests, but what happened was much worse. She had been given a bill by the hospital since the insurance had refused to pay for it, citing that it was not in the scope of cover. We were livid since we had made sure everything was in order. I sent my accounts manager to go have a talk with the insurance people as we tried to calm her down. The manager came back super angry and told me that basically after showing them the evidence, the insurance people just told them to buzz off. I decided to personally go visit that office and get a clear understanding of what was happening. They kept me waiting for an hour and even after that had the audacity to inform me the director from the head office who was in the area had declined to meet with me because he was quote unquote busy. I was upset to high heavens, so I decided to go to their head office in the capital city, a two hour flight. The head office was no help and informed me that they had revised their policy and that it was not covered. I asked when the policy was revised. They informed me a month prior. I informed them the surgery was done five months prior and we had the documentations. They claimed that it was 12 months retrospective. I inquired why I was not informed of it since this was big news and I have held policies with them and they told me that they had informed their large clients and would inform the other clients when the insurances were due for renewal. I demanded to speak to their boss, company vice president, since the CEO was not around and they boldly told me they had no time for me and frankly that, in verbatim, we are a large company and have no time to argue with low-end clients. If you don't like it, you can frankly leave and find a new insurance company. The Revenge If I had been initially upset, I was full-blown mad now. I was livid and filled with rage. In all my years, I may have experienced some disrespect and I accepted it not to make problems, but this time it went too far. I decided in the heat of the moment to switch everything and be done with them. I flew back home and just plain went to the hospital and settled the bill in full and took the receipt to my employee who initially insisted that she would do anything to pay me back, but I refused since it was in no way her fault and I'll be darned if she pays for something that was way out of her control. I had a few days to cool down and talked with my directors. The words still etched in my mind. I asked how long it would take us to switch to another insurance. They went ahead and checked out a few large rivals of the insurance we had and discovered that if we switched, it would take six months for the new insurance to provide full coverage. The firm we picked, who I'll call New Insurance, offered us a way better deal to the one we had and not only comprehensive coverage, dental and optical, they also included mental health coverage, physiotherapy and occupational therapy coverage, rehabilitative services, mobile device acquisition, prosthesis or wheelchairs for some of the disabled employees, smart cards for direct payments and outpatient visits, kind of like a debit card, and a dedicated team of relationship managers. It would cost me a little more, but I didn't really care. The people who dealt with us from our previous insurance, who I'll call old insurance, seemed unfazed that I was pulling my company from them since they thought it was just a small business. They looked puzzled when I came in with several people and a few boxes of documents. What they failed to realize was that apart from that one business, which is a restaurant, I have three popular bars, a cab company, a hotel resort, cleaning service chain, a building, and a residential guard service, and several rental buildings in the town and around the country. 
Their shock was compounded when they were informed by the lawyer just who I am, and the shock, awe, confusion, and panic when they heard my family name was an extremely satisfying sight. Cue the pleading and attempted negotiations and apologies. It was so big that the news reached their head office, who sent not only their director, the one who was apparently too big to see me, but also their chief legal officer, chief financial officer, and president of the company. I somehow also earned a personalized call from their CEO who was abroad. No amount of sweet talking was changing my mind, and by the end of six weeks, we had completely removed ourselves from the old insurance. It was now a waiting game to the beginning of the new insurance coverage, and we really, really hoped that no one would become unwell by that time, but we were ready just in case. In that waiting time, and after the new insurance commenced, I talked to my friends and my family on one of my holiday visits. My older brother's kids adore me, and the family kind of realized that they were jerks to me and are trying to re-enter my life, and I thought that was that. Aftermath My friends and family took my words and also pulled their businesses from the insurance to other insurances. The company took such a huge hit, and when lockdown came around and was a big deal, they were barely floating. They went into receivership soon after and were acquired by the insurance I had moved to, who happened to be their greatest rivals. The directors and CEO were given their golden parachutes and resigned, and most of their employees were luckily retained apart from the senior executives, including the ones who told my manager to buzz off. In a cruel twist of irony, the building they were operating on in our town was sold, and if you guessed I purchased it, you would be absolutely correct. I decided to remodel the inside and turn it into a business rental space. All in all, it was a bit of a sweet payback, and wherever they are, I hope those disrespectful guys learned that everyone is human, and they are not above anyone, and remember that karma is a cold and heartless jerk. Maintenance guy at Senior Living Center gets revenge on satellite TV companies. Over 200 plus residents emerge victorious. I'm the maintenance director at an independent senior living center. It's pretty much an apartment complex in which you have to be a senior citizen to reside. We provide three meals a day, housekeeping, activities, a bus for transportation, and several other amenities to increase the quality of life because more times than not, they will spend the final years of their life here. Our facility is family owned and oriented. Family members of current employees are encouraged to apply for positions. We have one rule in our employee handbook, ensure resident safety, happiness, and prolongment of life. I take my job very seriously and I take pride in it. I try to go above and beyond to make them all happy. Each resident during the daytime either listens to the radio, plays crossword puzzles, or most of the time watch their favorite TV shows. We do not provide television service. Each resident has to provide it themselves if they choose. Over the last year, there has been a trend of televisions not working in countless units, and when this happens, they are very upset. When I get a work order for a TV, I go and check it out. Most of the time, there's nothing I can do. If the cable isn't cut, everything is plugged in, and there is no obstruction to the satellite signal, it's going to be a software issue. When this happens, I install an air antenna until their regular service is fixed. I call the company, and a tech comes out, fixes it, and usually within a couple of hours, it stops working again. This is a never-ending cycle of upset residents. Over the course of an entire year, I spoke with several supervisors and tried to schedule for someone to come out and go through the entire property with me to address each issue. They weren't having that. They wanted me to go to each individual unit and have that particular resident call them. This is almost impossible. A lot of them have trouble hearing and discussing complex matters over the telephone, let alone know the four-digit code and the answer to the secret question. Our resident was out of service for over 60 days and I demanded they refund or discount this particular resident properly. They ended up only giving her $21 off, which isn't even half of a single month's payment. When I spoke with this particular representative, I told them that wasn't enough and I would be throwing all of their dishes in the dumpster. This is just the tip of the iceberg. These companies have caused significant property damage to the facility. They've ran the coax in the gutters and down the downspouts, ran cables draped over the sidewalk, which is a tripping hazard, installed dishes in the center of courtyards and wherever is convenient for them. All over the property, cables are strung out on top of the grass for hundreds of feet. They don't bother to bury any cables. I've discussed this numerous times with the owner of the facility over the last year. The last time I spoke with him about it, he gave me the okay to handle the situation and do whatever needed to be done to fix the issue. My options were limited, and the only feasible option I could concoct was using a landline company that didn't need a satellite dish. 
Well, I have officially finished running new coax to every single unit and a landline company has come in and installed boxes and services in each resident's apartment. Residents who have previously had to pay a monthly fee for their television service now get their service free of charge. Those that never had service now do. We've saved over 50 residents money each month and all in total over 200 plus now have television service that is included in their rent without any increase whatsoever. This was revenge for the representative talking to Ms. T in such a negative and rude tone. I couldn't be happier for my residents. Our senior citizens are some of the most precious things we all enjoy. They hold all of our wisdom. Good day. You want to make things fair? I'll show you fair. A couple of weeks ago, my kids and the neighbors decided to have a bake sale. We live in a tourist area with high foot traffic and the kids made a lot of money. I tell the kids I ought to charge them for the labor. I said I'd help bake and ingredients so they learn the concept of net gains, but instead I'll donate to their cause and just to bring me back the money I lent them to make change. I love seeing the kids be entrepreneurial, work so hard and get so excited at their success. After a couple of hours, the neighbor's son decides he's bored and wants to go home, so he tells my kid, when you're done, come by and deliver half my money. Mine says, hey, that's not fair. If you're leaving, we should split the money now. Mind you, the bulk of their sales was my baking. Neighbor kid gets upset, but my kid sticks to what he said. They split the money and the kid leaves in a huff. My kid comes in a few hours later, having lugged home all the gear and cleaned up, annoyed that the neighbor kid got annoyed at them. Then I got a knock on the door. It's the neighbor's mom with the kid who's still pouting. Mom's holding a receipt. Mom explains that they purchased a bunch of stuff for the bake sale. It cost a lot of money and it's not fair that my kid is making money off their stuff and that they should be compensated for what they purchased. The receipt lists a bunch of items I immediately see they didn't use, like two boxes of cereal when they used one, napkins that I'd ended up providing, but whatever. And never mind that her son went home early and left mine to clean up, and never mind that I'd been churning out batches of cookies all morning. I'm irked that they've taken what was a fun, cheerful day of kids making money hands over fist and shown up at my door making me engage in a super awkward conversation because they assume their kid can't be wrong. So I say, of course, and fetch my receipts. I sit down and in front of them and out loud, calculate the cost of lemonade and cups used. I calculate the cost of flour, sugar, chocolate chips, vanilla, and butter per batch of cookies multiplied by the number of batches made. I toss in the baking soda for free, so generous. I even subtract the value of leftover cookies. Did I mention I made a lot of cookies? The neighbor kid has to hand over $23. They got pretty quiet all of a sudden. I thanked the lady for making sure things were fair and offered her a plate of cookies to take home. She declined. Am I the jerk? I reported my car missing after my husband took it to attend his brother's wedding. My husband, who's 35, does not have a car. He sold his old car to help pay for his brother's wedding. I did not agree on this, but he had this car before we got together, so it's a shared property. Besides that, I have my own car, so that didn't affect me until my husband started complaining about having to commute to work and hang out places. He tried to get me to let him drive my car several times, but I stood firm and put a boundary making him understand that my car will never be driven by him. One of the reasons why is because of how bad of a driver he is. His brother lives out of town. My husband asks if he can drive my car to the wedding, but I refuse. But not because I'm not invited, another story for another day, but because like I said, my car is off limits. He threw a fit calling me unreasonable to let him take public transportation because he can barely stand it for 10 minutes, let alone hours. I said it wasn't my problem, which irritated him, but made him stop arguing about it. The day that he was supposed to travel out of town, I woke up at 10 a.m. and couldn't find my car key. I went outside and I couldn't find my car either. I was beyond upset. I called him and like I expected, he took it and was on his way to the other town. I lost it and told him I gave him no permission to take it for the whole five days and said that if he won't turn around with it and come home, then I'd call the cops and report it missing. His response was, you wouldn't dare do that because you know what would happen. I hung up on him, then immediately called the police and told them about my situation. I did not tell them my husband took it because they think it's a family dispute and decide to not get involved. I just report it missing. Two hours later, I got a call from my husband saying he was back in town and was being held at our local police station. I went to the station and talked to the cops. 
My husband made a scene there, saying over and over again that I gave him permission to take it and said I was acting out of jealousy and spite because he was going to attend an event that I was not invited to. I took my car and went home, but he had to stay a little longer. He came home in the evening and went on a rage fit about how I created an awful situation and almost caused him to miss his brother's wedding. He called me vindictive, bitter, and a lunatic to call the police on him and try to accuse him of stealing my car. He had to leave the same day to be able to get there with his family and decided to extend his stay and still hasn't gotten back yet. Right now, his mom and brother are blasting me for what happened and calling me spiteful. Not the jerk, but I get the feeling that there's a lot more going on here. Your husband sold his car to help pay for his brother's wedding, even though he needed it to commute? Is your husband prone to making bad decisions? And he paid for his brother's wedding, even though you, his wife, were not invited to it? I'm sorry, but what kind of marriage is this? OP. Yeah, he and his brother are very close. I'm on bad terms. Also, we don't talk at all with his brother because he kept accusing me of trying to drive a wedge between him and my husband. He can think whatever he wants, but none of his claims are true. Unfortunately, my husband and his mom think I'm the bad guy here. In my opinion, you should start stashing cash away and documenting everything that you own that is not subject to community property, if you live in a place with community property laws. I don't see this marriage lasting much longer, and your husband has already demonstrated that he will lie to the authorities to get himself out of trouble. It didn't work this time, but you should protect yourself. That's all assuming you're not already consulting a divorce attorney, who can give you much better advice than I, who am definitely not an attorney, could. Everyone sucks here. Why are you even together? Just break up. You both sound like absolute nightmares. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. I know Reddit tells everyone to get divorced, but, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's kind of warranted. My Karen sister took money from our safe. My little sister, who's 16, has had her fair share of behavior issues throughout the past few years. She doesn't keep up with school, lies, and was diagnosed with depression and anxiety, along with everyone else in our family. Since the beginning of this year, her behavior has gotten worse. She's been frequently lying and doctoring stories, as well as getting in trouble with the law, in and out of the house with zero consequences. A few weeks ago, she had called me and told me, along with everyone else in the family, that she had bought me tickets to my favorite artist concert in the fall. I obviously questioned it and kept telling her not to lie to me, but she insisted it was true, so I got very excited. Two weeks later, I noticed that she kept buying very expensive items, such as a computer, new shoes, makeup, more electronics, etc. But I figured it was because she got a new job and was making better money. For the more expensive items, like the computer, she told me it was a gift from a family member for her birthday, which was the week prior. She even went as far as to fake a phone call with said family member to thank them for such a wonderful gift. While she was having the time of her life, I was on a completely different path. A week before her birthday, my car's engine blew. I should note that I'm a college student who works minimum wage, and it would have been out of my price range to even try to afford a new engine, so the car got towed. I was devastated. My parents and my grandma decided to help me by getting me some money together, about $6,000, and giving it to me to buy a new car. About a week after I noticed my sister was buying these expensive products, I finally found my dream car. My parents and I went to grab the money from our safe to go and buy the car when we realized about $3,000 was missing from the envelopes we put together. My dad immediately checked my little sister's bank account to find a $1,200 deposit via ATM that week. We also found receipts from purchases that she made with the remaining cash. When we confronted my sister, she said she didn't know why she took the money. I was and still am devastated that my own blood would steal from me. But my parents, more so my dad, whose sister did the same thing, wants me to forgive her because she's apologized for it. I told him no way and that she has yet to apologize to me and that I have no intentions on having her in my life when she's acting like this. My dad says she's going through a tough time and needs our help. So, am I the jerk? Update, I want to add that as soon as my parents found out, we took her to return as much as we could. They were also devastated. Invited my neighbor to church, now she wants nothing to do with me. My neighbor, Emma and I, both 30-ish female, 
Our aunts smile at each other and say, hi, how are you every time, kind of talking terms with each other. It's generally a pleasant family, especially her daughter who has cerebral palsy and is as charming as any 10 year old you would find. Saw Emma in their garden yesterday and I got to talking with her when she brought up how her daughter feels a little lonely at times because of being homeschooled and not having many friends around. Obviously, her condition means she can't go around to the park and play as much. Actually, she even prefers to stay at home reading or watching shows. She only maybe needs similar aged people to talk to at times as she has no siblings. So I suggest that my neighbor attend church a few Sundays in order to avail a sort of service the local church provides where they make book clubs or flower clubs or bake clubs by grouping together some of the kids who are interested from the community. So if she signs up Alex for such a thing, the church would send some potential friends to their house and do activities and have a chat with Alex. But the problem is that you can't just fill out a form for this. You have to go to church and talk a bit to some mothers or the pastor before requesting to hold the clubs at your own place. This is something people do for each other and it will be unsafe to send anyone over to a stranger's house. Emma may as well stop going after assuring the other mothers that she is trustworthy. Emma got offended at this and told me not to try to lure her into my religion. Church was a personal choice and that she didn't want to become a fanatic by volunteering to be brainwashed every week. I am a practicing Christian, not very diligent in it though, but all I suggested was that she just make acquaintance enough at the church to help Alex make friends. Nevertheless, she called me a jerk for pushing religion on her and her daughter. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Don't take it personally, but activities at a church are centered around your beliefs, contrary to city or state provided activities that are bent by the law to be inclusive of all. Also, the mother might think that exposing her kid to people that will tend to try to convince her to believe in your religion it would not be good for her daughter. You're the jerk. The sad part is, you don't even realize how disgusting your actions were. You're using your neighbor's situation to try roping her into your own twisted beliefs. Don't be surprised when the whole neighborhood finds out what kind of a person you really are. When will you people learn that just because you believe in BS does not give you the right to force it onto people who actually have good hearts and care about the world? Ew. Yes. Don't try to lure people into your religion. And that church is pretty gross only being interested in helping kids of families who are religious. You're the jerk. Religion is not a topic to approach lightly with someone you're just on a friendly smile based kind of thing. Yes, you're the jerk. That is exactly how it works. First, try to get them in your church, then do some activities, get attached to other people, and bam, now you can as well convert if you want us to help you out further. You may have good intentions, but your neighbor is right to be suspicious. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or her neighbor? Please let us know. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you love the Lord, good for you. But you probably don't want to talk about it on Reddit. They'll tear you a new one. Am I the jerk for not wanting to be a dad? I, male 29, had a kid when I was 19. I wasn't ready to be a dad and I asked her to not go through with it. She refused and decided to keep it, so I agreed to pay child support, but I wouldn't be involved in her life. I didn't tell my family about any of this. Well now, after 10 years of this arrangement, just three months ago when I was at work, I received a barrage of angry messages from my parents asking me if I have a kid. Apparently, my ex had told them everything because she is sick and wants someone to look after the kid since her own family refused to do it. They were mad at me, telling me it was very selfish to hide their grandchild from them. I'm an only child and she is their only grandchild, so they agreed to look after the kid and brought her into our home. Yes, I live with my parents to help them with the expenses. I told them that I can't stop them from doing this, but I still don't want to be her dad, and they agreed. She has been living with us for the past three months, but everyone forgot about our agreement. Two days ago, my parents left her with me to go somewhere. I told them I don't want to babysit, but no one listened to me. As soon as they left, she started coming into my room with different excuses. I finally got annoyed and told her to go to her room and not to come out until her grandparents come home. My parents come back and freaked out when they found out. They called me a jerk for being a horrible dad, but I never wanted to be a dad and I made it clear several times. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. The kid is 10 years old. Her mother is apparently so unwell that she has to reach out to literal strangers to ensure her kid gets care and you can't even be civil for one afternoon. Have you even considered how the kid feels? You're the jerk. From a person to person, have you no civility? Must you be a miserable entity to a 10-year-old? What happened to you to make you so unkind? 
It appears OP hasn't matured much between the ages of 19 to 29 years old. Seriously, OP, I get you didn't want to have a kid, but you still partook in the decisions that led to this. Yeah, your parents are slightly the jerks for going back on their agreement, but you're taking this out on your daughter, whose mother is sick. So now this girl is without her mother and stuck with a father who's acting like an inconvenienced bratty teenager. She's 10. She's past the age of being a screaming kid you just have to clean up all the time. You can share hobbies and interests with her. Be a good, empathetic person and maybe have her play some video games with you or something. Make her feel wanted. Your parents are already taking over the role of caring for her and parenting her. If you keep acting like this, she will never want anything to do with you in the future if you suddenly grow up and decide you actually want to be in her life. You'll also have very bad karma. Edit. And to everyone who's like, well, he's being forced to be a parent against his will, no, he's not. If he moves out of his parents' house, which at 29 years old he should be able to do, problem solved. If he's going to remain there, the least he can do is be kind and respectful to his daughter, not just tell her to be quiet and go to her room, making her feel even more unwanted than she already feels. Exactly. Countless kids were never planned, but you got this woman pregnant anyway. It no longer matters if you want to be a dad. You are a dad. Sure, you have the choice to abandon your daughter and be a deadbeat if you want, but then you have to live with the fact that you're a deadbeat, child support or not. Money may help a bit, but she's a human being and you're not there for her. You're an emotional deadbeat, and honestly, that's worse in my opinion. Money is not the most important factor when it comes to determining if you're a good dad. All the child support does is save yourself legally. Your parents are right, you are a horrible dad. Seriously, shame on you. Words cannot express how excruciatingly awful you are. You're the jerk. I completely disagree. Is OP a jerk for not being civil to a 10 year old for a few hours? Sure but he is not a jerk for not wanting to be a father. He already told the mother of the kid and his parents that he doesn't want a kid. He made that clear from the moment she got pregnant. He made that clear when his parents decided to look after the kid. Those are choices made by other people, other people who were informed of the circumstances. He is not the dad to that kid. He's nothing more than a donor at this point. If you want to be a parent, good for you, but you don't get to judge other people who don't. He doesn't need to be there for her. The mother made the choice knowing she was going to be a single mother. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean this guy is a jerk. He told her he wants no part, she did it anyway, and he paid child support. OP's baby mama is a massive jerk. OP's parents are jerks, and OP is slightly a jerk for responding to the kid like that. OP did nothing wrong in regards to raising her. He doesn't owe her emotional support. You're the jerk, so move out. If you don't want to be a dad, Go get your own place and pay the child support you paid your ex to your parents. They can also get help from the state as official foster parents, but might need to take courses. Your daughter needs someone to live with besides her mother who is sick. I would have reached out to extended family too if I was the only one able to care for my kid and I was too sick to do so. Sending her to her room because she's such an inconvenience to you is such a jerk move. She's still a human being who recently was uprooted from a life that she knew. You're the jerk. I get that you never intended to be a dad, but the least you can do is now act like an adult. She didn't choose to be part of your life either. She's just trying to make the best of a new and probably very scary situation. As long as you're both living there, you've got to at least do the bare minimum, which means actually spending time with her instead of sending her to her room so that you don't have to deal with her. Everyone sucks here. I say all this as a woman. Your ex should have never contacted you from the start. You guys decided a long time ago that you wouldn't be involved and she agreed. I feel for her being a single mother and her family sucks, but ultimately she decided to take on the kid herself. She should have handled it by herself. Your parents suck for taking on the kid and not respecting your choice to not be involved. That all being said, this girl was brought back into your life and while you may not like it and while you don't have to act like a father to her, you're a jerk for treating her like a nuisance. This kid has done nothing wrong and had no choice in being brought into your home. Shutting her out is just messed up on a human level. Again, you don't have to be her father. You should have looked at this like she was your niece or something and treated her with basic respect and kindness. I'm sure people will argue against me saying that you need to take responsibility as a father, but I just disagree. Again, what I do think you need to do is take responsibility as an adult and temporary caretaker and not shun or neglect any kid that is under your temporary supervision. 
So are you basically saying that for the single mom who could be seriously ill, the best option was to let the daughter go into foster care instead of contacting the paternal grandparents? Get out of here. This man is 29 years old. If he doesn't want to be a dad, he can move out. But the grandparents do not suck for taking in the kid. Okay, so nobody is going to like this, but not the jerk. You're saying you made it clear you did not want to be a dad to your ex from the beginning. No one would be this harsh on a mom for adopting out her kid if she didn't want to be a mom. My mom's biological dad didn't want to be a dad back in the 60s, but he was made to and he treated my mom and her brother like dirt. He was a jerk, yeah, but he wouldn't have been if he wasn't forced to be a dad when he didn't want kids. My mom and uncle were much better off when he signed away his rights as a dad and my grandma met the only man I recognize as my grandpa. You aren't a jerk for blowing off a kid you didn't even want to have. You didn't want any of this. She made the decision to have the baby and you made it clear you didn't want to. You messed up at 19. So many people do. I would lawyer up, go to court, and try to get rid of any legal responsibility you have. Also, you mentioned you live with your parents to help them. If they won't respect your wishes on this, it may be time to branch out on your own. Best of luck. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Oh, I really can't wait to read the comments we get about this one. Natural occurring colors? You got it. In the early 2000s, I worked at a Canadian casino. The place had so many ridiculous rules, including some very particular rules about makeup. The makeup rules were as follows. 1. No fake eyelashes. 2. No fake fingernails or fingernail extensions. 3. No makeup that is not a natural color. The natural color one confused me. What is deemed natural? Who decides what is and isn't natural? I asked my manager for clarification, but she couldn't give me any. Just keep it natural. Use natural occurring colors and you'll be fine. This did not sit well with me. Cue malicious compliance. My aunt has her master's in environmental science. I went to her house one evening and picked her brain about natural occurring colors. She informed me that, scientifically, natural occurring colors are colors that can be found directly in nature. She even showed me a textbook that directly spoke about naturally occurring colors. I borrowed the textbook and highlighted the paragraphs that specified this. Keep in mind, this was well before you could just Google something. The only way to back up the claim was to carry that 750-page textbook to work with me. My next shift, I went all out. Green eyeliner, eggplant-colored eyeshadow, yellow nail polish on one hand and mango-colored on the other hand. I hit the floor to work and within the first few minutes I get hauled into my manager's office. OP, what do you think you're doing? You cannot wear these colors. You know our policy states natural occurring colors only when it comes to makeup. Head to the staff bathroom immediately and remove it. Wordlessly, I headed to the staff bathroom, but instead of taking the makeup off, I went to my locker, grabbed the textbook, and marched back to my manager's office. Excuse me, manager? I am wearing naturally occurring colors. Here, look at this textbook that specifically states what naturally occurring are, by definition. I watched her face change as she read the book. First, she looked upset, then worried, and then finally resigned herself to what was happening. OP, do you really need to be that type of person? Me. The type that follows the rules? I thought that's what you wanted me to do. She asked me to head back to the door. For the remaining time I was employed there, I wore whatever color makeup I wanted and so did almost all of my coworkers. They tried coming out with new rules but could never get the wording right. Forget stupid rules. Malicious compliance for the win. Am I the jerk for calling out my stepbrother on his Instagram post? I, male 17, and my mom, female 39, moved in with my stepdad, male 46, and stepbrother, who's 15, about two years ago. So I have a nice sneaker collection that I have amassed through working a casual job and reselling sneakers. Now stepbrother, who hasn't shown any interest in my sneaker collection previously, I guess is at the age now where it matters more. He's been coming into my room more often to have a look at the collection, and he has also recently grown into the same size as me. This is important. Recently, he's been asking me to let him wear some of the shoes in my collection. I'm opposed to this because, one, they're my shoes. I feel like I should have the final say in who gets to wear them. Two, he's not careful and absolutely trashes his shoes. Three, common sense, but wearing a shoe decreases its value significantly. I like to hold some unworn in case the price spikes. So every time he's asked, I've told him no. Recently, he told me that he has a very important outing he's going to. He's just going out with friends and wants to wear some of the shoes. 
I told him no, but this time he threw an absolute fit and got stepdad involved. Stepdad told me that I'm being greedy and that I should just let stepbrother wear one pair since I have so many. I told him that I value each and every one of them and told him the resale value of the pair and stepbrother was absolutely shocked. This devolved into an argument about me paying rent when really I paid for the retail price and not the resale price, which he does not seem to understand. Stepdad and stepbrother left when they realized I wasn't budging. I thought the situation was over. I head off to work on Saturday. However, on the bus ride home, I was scrolling through Instagram and stepbrother posted a picture of himself wearing the exact same shoe that I did not let him wear. I was angry and I commented, why are you wearing my shoes? He deleted my comment, but it seemed like it was too late. Some of his friends saw, which embarrassed him because he had told them that the shoes were his. He told stepdad about what happened, who called me in a fury, asking me why did I have to embarrass his son like that, and that the shoes were worth nothing. I yelled back at him that stepbrother had no business wearing my stuff, and I had the feeling that stepdad encouraged it too, so forget you both, and I hung up. When I got home, I full on got yelled at. He told me that I should be lucky that I'm allowed to live under this roof. My mom stepped in to defend me, and now they've been arguing for the past day and a half. I asked stepbrother to give me my shoes back and he did. I told him to never touch my stuff again and have been holding it up in my room since. Things are really tense in the house now. So Reddit, am I the jerk for not allowing my brother to wear my shoes and then embarrassing him on Instagram when he did so anyways? Not the jerk. Your stepdad sounds horrible. You're 17, he shouldn't be demanding rent or threatening to throw you out. It's his job as the parent to provide housing. Your stepbrother deserved to be called out. He stole something to pass off as his own, and it's his own fault that he got negative reactions when the truth was out. Also, OP should consider buying a doorknob with a lock and key or an electronic lock, something he can lock up while he's not there. Something tells me stepdad is the type of guy who would lose his crap if he did this. He very much seems like a, you don't get to lock your door in my house kind of guy. Tell him if he wants to start charging you rent, you're going to start charging his son with theft. He knew you were part of the package when he married your mom and moved you into his house. You're 17. They can't charge you rent legally. Your stepdad is an all-around jerk, in this case at least. Maybe he should encourage his son to work for what he wants rather than stealing it. Am I the jerk for not giving my sister alone time and saying she can leave? I'm 26 and Anna is 30. My sister Anna lives in a different state. Used to live with her husband, but got divorced last year and said she was feeling lonely and misses us, so she came over for two weeks. She wanted to spend a week at my place and a week at our mom's, but we eventually agreed on four days at mine. So Anna arrived a couple days ago and yesterday asked me if we could let her have some time to herself. She had caught up with an old friend and wanted to invite him over, so if me and my husband could give her a few hours in the evening, she said to go for a movie and she'd pay for the tickets. I told her no. We're not planning on going anywhere that night. Anna kept insisting that she needed some alone time and it was only for a few hours. My husband overheard some of this. We were getting kind of loud. So he told her that she needs to stop pushing me and we won't be going anywhere. Anna got pretty mad and said that we were being petty for the sake of it and didn't understand she was going through a hard time. I'd had enough. So I told her this is our house, not hers. And if she has an issue, she's free to leave. We didn't talk for a bit after that but later she said she talked to mom and is going over to her place earlier as it's obvious I don't want her around and left last night. Was I just being difficult? Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. If she really wants to get jiggy with it, she can go to a motel. I gave you a $50 discount and you're still not happy? I used to work at a call center for a large Canadian telecommunications company. They are a service provider for TV, internet, home phones, and cell phones. I was a customer care agent and at the time I was working in the end of promotions department. I'd be the person you speak with when your one or two year discount was set to expire. I had been through many different departments before I was moved to the end of promotion team so I had access to multiple discounts a regular care agent wouldn't have access to because they never changed my authorization when I was moved to the new department. This allowed me to bend the rules quite a bit when it came to renewing promotions for some customers. Now, most care agents have limited discounts they can give. Typically, the system would generate a discount for a customer account based on their tenure and services with us. 
That's what the company claimed, which I find to be BS, as I've seen accounts that were created back in 99 that would be tagged for only $10 off and sometimes nothing at all, and they would have to pay in market rates. This is where my access level came in handy. If I spoke with a customer who was super polite and gave me no trouble or stress, I would apply a better discount than what was originally tagged, especially if I see they've been with us for years and even sometimes decades. Example, tagged for $20 off, give them $35 or $40 off instead. Now, the company always claimed to keep track if we apply discounts that a customer wouldn't be eligible for, but I think that was also BS because I did this to many accounts and it never came up during meetings with my manager. So one day I get a call, a customer that's been with the company for a year or two. Let's call him Mark. So Mark's promotion is coming to an end pretty soon and he's looking to get a new one and at the same time upgrade his services. He was on a mid-tier TV package and had 500 megabit unlimited internet. If I recall, he was probably paying around $140 per month. He wanted to move up to our highest TV package and our gigabit internet plan, which is the highest you can get for both TV and internet with this company. And this said company is not a budget service provider, so typically that combination of products would cost around $180 before taxes and the price just climbs up depending on how many boxes you have for the TV, if you have a home phone and if you have any extra TV add-ons. So I tell him I will gladly look into it and place him on hold. Since he was very polite and I was in a good mood, I was happy to bend the rules for him, especially after seeing he was only tagged for a $15 discount. He had a $25 discount before, so he would have been paying $10 more if he wanted to keep his services the same and definitely a whole lot more if he upgraded to the highest package. So eventually, I come back to him with a $50 discount for one year. He will still be paying more for making that change, but it's a whole lot better than the $15 off that he was supposed to get initially. Now, all of a sudden, his attitude and tone does a complete 180. He starts getting angry and starts getting rude. He was talking as if he thought I was joking when I said $50 is the most we could give him. He went on a rant about how he's been with us for so many years and how he deserves to pay less than what he was paying before and on top of that, get upgraded services. I explained that unfortunately, because he is upgrading to our highest packages, that the increase in price is inevitable. I informed him that if he wanted to, the same discount could be applied to his current services and he'd be saving $25 more than what he's been paying. Then he pulls the same card I hear so often, like, well, my friend has that package and is only paying $80. Or, I see newer customers getting it for so much less. Which, in most cases, sure, it can happen. But with the combination of products he has, I know 100% he was just pulling these prices out of nowhere. He got angrier and was demanding that he gets a better discount. And on top of that, he wanted the Crave slash Movie slash HBO add-on, which cost $19.99, for free for a year on top of that for wasting his time. I start to get frustrated and explained once again that it is not something we can do and the $50 is the best we can offer. He asks to speak to retention, which at the time was the end of promotion department and I explained that he's already speaking with them. He starts to lose it and says he wants to speak to a manager because he wants to pay what he feels like he should pay based on his tenure, which again was only around two years, which may seem like a long time but in this kind of industry, it doesn't really mean much. We do have a dedicated team of managers that take calls when a customer is getting crazy. Their primary goal is just to defuse the situation, but they are not there to give better discounts if we already went through the best options, and they always made that very clear. I explained that a manager cannot provide a better discount, but I can still transfer him to one, as it is a company policy to get them to a manager if they request one, no matter what. So I place him on hold, and what we do is speak to the manager on the line first to explain the situation and the options we as an agent went through before escalating, and then they take the call from there. Usually you're supposed to disconnect from the call once you patch the customer through, but sometimes I like to stick around and mute myself just to listen to the manager tell the customer the exact same thing I already told them. Their reactions are usually priceless. So I explain to the manager, we'll call him Fred, that I had already offered the customer a way better discount than what we had before. I was worried that they would question why or how I gave them more than what we were tagged for, but this manager didn't seem to care. I explained how he had wanted to pay less than what he used to pay while upgrading to our highest package and now on top of that have a $20 add-on given to him for free for a year. Fred scoffs 
because they understand how ridiculous that was and told me to patch him through. I add Mark to the call, introduce him to Fred, and explain that they will take the call from there. Now, all of a sudden, he's acting very polite again and says, Oh, thank you so much, OP. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Take care. And continues this act while he talks to the manager as if he wasn't just screaming at the top of his lungs at me moments ago. I stick around to hear the conversation play out. Fred does a quick rundown of what Mark was asking us to do just to make sure nothing was missed. And Mark says, yup, that all sounds right to me. Then Fred pretty much tells him what he is asking for cannot be done and that I had already offered the best discount we can provide and explained that most customers pay way more for what he is being upgraded to. He starts getting angry again and starts yelling that he is being mistreated as a long-term customer and is threatening to cancel all of his services with us and move to a competitor. Fred says he's sorry he feels that way and that if he would like to, they can start the cancellation procedure for him. Mark had had enough and hung up right after. I got a kick from hearing that and went on with my day. A month goes by. I'm taking calls and having a good day. It's slow, not a lot of callers, but the ones I do get have been very nice. And suddenly, a call comes in. The account pops up. I do a quick look over the account summary and see the customer's name. It looks familiar. I check the account's previous interactions and see mine and Fred's from a month ago. A big smile goes across my face as I am speaking to none other than Mark, calling us back again. Now this kind of thing is very rare. With a company this big, we typically have a lot of callers and a lot of employees, so it's extremely uncommon that I speak to the same person more than once. I'm thinking because it was a slow day, they had given early leave to the agents who wanted it, so there must not have been a lot of agents online taking calls, thus having this call routed to me since I wasn't available. I do the standard greeting. Thank you for calling, how can I help? But in the inside, I've got a grin on my face because I know he's most likely calling us back because his discount had expired and his price has gone up. He's either calling to cancel or to try and get a discount again. I was right on the nose with that one. He calls saying that his discount has expired and he's looking to get a new one. Now, Mark didn't seem to recognize that he was talking to me again. He thought I was just a different agent because he mentioned he was given an offer from someone about a month ago that he was looking to accept. Here's where the malicious compliance comes in. As per our last call, you said you wanted a discount based off your tenure. Sure thing. As a matter of fact, the system has already generated a whopping $15 off based on that. I explained that unfortunately, because he's calling after his discount has ended, the original discount we had offered is now expired, and now we only have a $15 discount available. He starts to lose it again. Now in some cases, this actually does happen, where if a discount isn't accepted before the other one expires, the new offer also expires and cannot be added. I can agree, it's some slimy stuff that this company does so they can get more money. In this case, because the original $50 discount was never supposed to be given in the first place, I was able to say this and only offer what he was really tagged for. Once again, he begins to lose it. It plays out the same as it did before. I explain that this is the best we can offer. He throws a fit, wants to speak to a manager. Again, managers are not there to apply better discounts. Sometimes we do have something called a documented promise, where if in the notes someone was offered something, say $50 off and it didn't go through, we can still apply it. He could have lied and said he accepted it and it never went through, and the documented promise policy would have made it so that we had to give him that discount. In this case, because Fred and I both wrote in the notes that he declined that offer, it was gone for good. I once again transfer him to a manager and stick around to hear the fallout. The manager did not budge, told him the same thing, that $15 off was the only option and once again, it ends with him hanging up. I unfortunately never figured out what happened with Mark's account, but here's what could have happened. 1. He's still paying the in-market price for his services, which is a lot more than what he was paying before. 2. He accepted the $15 off and is still paying more than before. 3. He canceled with us and moved to a competitor. One less problematic, rude, and entitled customer. You want a ticket? Fine, you get a ticket. I work at a big online company that does lead generation for real estate. And prior to lockdown, I was working on our tech support team. But for one reason or another, not relevant to this post, they decided to move me and my teammates to the success team, a similar job, but less techy. This happened on March 16th, the day we became work from home. Now, I realized pretty early on that I was never actually removed from any of the support roles access. 
I could still view things I shouldn't, like, oh say, how many tickets they had open. In my day, we would finish all of our tickets in a day, to the point where we would watch Netflix and fight over inbound calls. At this time, they had over 3,000 open tickets. I'm a very nice person, very customer oriented, so instead of adding to the ticket queue and making the customer wait a month or two for an answer, if they had called into the success team, I would try to resolve their issue now if I could, instead of sending them to the support team like I was technically supposed to for tech support. But not this customer. This customer called in screaming, and I'm good with de-escalation, I am. I tried to explain that I could help if she had let me. I tried to explain that I used to be part of the tech team. Heck, I even tried giving her their phone number because that is a faster way of getting help. But no, she just kept screaming at me to put a ticket in for her because she's having notification issues and she needs a ticket put in because her notifications aren't working. Literally broken record style. Why she couldn't put the ticket in herself, I have no idea. But you know what, ma'am? Sure, absolutely. There you go. I just put that ticket in and I'm sure the tech team will get to it as soon as they can. They were six weeks behind in answering tickets at that point. I have no idea what happened beyond that since it is a fairly big company, but I'm sure she called and screamed at someone else when the ticket wasn't answered right away. Still made me laugh though, because her issue was a fairly easy one to fix that I could actually have fixed for her in about five minutes if she'd have let me. But instead, I did what she asked and put in a ticket. Entitled neighbor keeps stealing from my garden. Big mistake. Well, I should have known that no good deed goes unpunished. We have a small vegetable and herb garden in the corner of our yard. Two neighbors have the ability and my permission to reach over the fence and snip off any herbs they need. We always grow much more than we can use. One neighbor has been doing it for years with no problems. He takes a spring or two a few times a week and always asks me if he needs more than usual. He repays me in beautiful roses, but I would have no problem with not getting them in return. The other neighbor never cooked, so he never took any. Now he has a new girlfriend and she happened to introduce herself while I was planting the herbs, so I offered her some once it has a chance to grow a bit. So of course, two weeks after I planted, she snips off all but a few leaves off of every herb. Two weeks, I was livid. My boyfriend went over and explained that it was too soon, the plants were tiny, not ready, etc. He's much nicer than I am. The neighbor apologized profusely and said the girlfriend wouldn't be going anywhere near the herbs until I specifically allow it. A week later, I catch this jerk out there with a pair of scissors, but it's only been a week and there's nothing to snip out there yet. Apparently, she can't make meatballs without parsley and the grocery store within walking distance is too far to go. One of my plants has three leaves on it, seriously. The other neighbor doesn't dare take anything before mid-July. Certainly, he would never touch anything before I did. We looked at each other for a few seconds and then I just said, please get your herbs at this store from now on. I can't believe I managed to think of that. Usually I think of a great comeback 10 minutes after the fact. She turned bright red and went in the house. Hopefully she embarrassed herself enough to stay away. I don't want to have problems with this neighbor. He's nice and quiet and doesn't bother anyone. Tomorrow it will be a week since I caught her again. We'll see what happens. Am I the jerk for telling my dad his girlfriend didn't buy me a Starbucks drink? I, 17 female, have been living with my dad, who's 45, his girlfriend of two years, who's 33, and her daughter, who's 13, for a couple of months now, while my mom, who's 40, is visiting my sick grandfather in Sweden. I've only ever stayed at my dad's on weekends, so it's been hard getting used to living with his girlfriend and her kid full time. The kid is super whiny and pretty spoiled because girlfriend dotes on her, so I usually just stay in my room. Today, girlfriend was taking her daughter on a special outing because she passed a math test, and my dad suggested that I go with them for a girl's day out. I wanted to say no, but I knew that he wanted me to get to know his girlfriend and his girlfriend's daughter better, so I agreed. He gave his girlfriend $300 to spend during the outing. We spent the day going in and out of stores girlfriend's daughter liked in the mall complex. Girlfriend ended up buying her a ton of clothes, makeup, and other stuff that I don't remember. On our way back home, girlfriend stopped at the Starbucks because daughter wanted a drink and some cake pops. She ordered a drink for her and her daughter and two cake pops. I asked her if I could get something too and she said she ran out of money and she'd get me something next time. When they got their order, I asked if I could have one of the cake pops and girlfriend said that it was her daughter's treat for hard work and it would be wrong for me to take one since I didn't do anything that deserved being rewarded. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty upset. 
When we got back home, my dad saw their drinks and asked where mine was. I told him that I wasn't allowed to get one because I don't deserve it. His girlfriend got upset and said I was twisting her words and the daughter just said I was being greedy and was jealous of her. I know I'm not entitled to a drink or a cake pop, but I also don't think it's wrong to be a little annoyed. Am I the jerk? Oh, sweetie, not the jerk. And I want you to know that you absolutely were entitled to a drink and a cake pop or another treat of your choosing. Your dad gave her $300 that was meant to be spent on all three of you for the day out. Sure, her daughter may have earned something special for her hard work at school, but from the sound of it, he intended for all of you to get treated a bit, and it's disgusting that she would go to a coffee shop and get things for herself and her daughter, but not for you. As someone older than your dad, even, I can tell you that his girlfriend's behavior was super not okay, and not the way she should be treating her partner's kid. None of my friends would ever treat their stepkids or partner's kids that way in a million years. I'm so sorry that happened to you, and I'm really glad you told your dad. She deserves to get yelled at. OP. Thank you. You've really made me feel better. You are nowhere near in the wrong for being annoyed about the way they treated you, and the two of them should be ashamed of themselves for manipulating the situation, and by extension your father. Once they got called out for their nasty behavior, the $300 was for all three of you. The least they could have done was give you $3 for a cake pop. The fact that they didn't even want to do that should be a clear indication to your father that they cannot be trusted around you. You are definitely not the jerk his girlfriend was. But spill the tea, what was your dad's reaction to girlfriend's lame excuse? OP, this happened 30 minutes ago and before he said anything, I just went up to my room. I'm hearing yelling from downstairs though. I love my dad a lot and he's always looked out for me, so I don't think he wouldn't believe me. Update, I just finished talking to my dad. I explained everything that happened at the mall and he apologized and said he'll be returning everything that was bought and will be taking a day off work tomorrow so we could do something together. He also put up girlfriend and daughter in a hotel so I can have space from them and said they'll be staying there until my mom gets back. Once I'm ready to see them, he said they will apologize to me and once my mom comes back, he's going to have a talk with his girlfriend. Am I the jerk for proposing to my girlfriend at my brother's wedding? My brother and his wife got married last week. It was a big beach wedding with about 100 people. While the bride and groom were doing their photo shoot that took an hour, the guests were walking down the beach, having some snacks that were served, talking to each other, etc. We were waiting for the dinner to be served. My girlfriend and I had been together for 10 years and we have a kid together. Marriage just never came up. We are both really not the romantic type. When our son was born, I jokingly told her I'd propose to her on a beach at sunset someday. So after the wedding, we were walking down the beach. We were alone. No one was even paying any attention to us at all because there were a hundred people there. I just asked her, so, beach at sunset, will you marry me? She said yes. We had a good laugh, took a selfie together, and slowly walked back to the site of the reception. We haven't told anyone that we are getting married yet. It will be a courthouse wedding anyway. Two days ago, my girlfriend posted that selfie on her social media, tagged me, and wrote a caption, finally marrying the love of my life and a sunset beach proposal. Now, everyone who knew us knew it was a sarcastic caption and knew it was more of a joking post than anything else. Brother and sister-in-law called us very upset hours after that post. Sister-in-law said we ridiculed their wedding with our post. Brother said I'm the jerk for proposing at someone else's wedding. Am I the jerk? I was ready to say you're the jerk, but you didn't propose in front of anybody. You didn't even announce it at the reception and you waited two days to post it, so not the jerk. Sister-in-law is the one who's ridiculous here. I actually agree with you on this. Had any of the other guests noticed, then a definite you're the jerk. But the way this was under the radar, I'd go with not the jerk. Why? It wasn't during any part of the wedding. Because proposing during a wedding, the reception is part of the wedding event, is a huge no-no. Had someone else noticed it, then that would have been the topic of conversation, not the wedding, which is why it is a no-no. Since that didn't happen in this case, that's why I said not the jerk. The whole reason you shouldn't propose at someone's wedding is because the attention should be on the bride and groom and because it would be rude, insensitive, etc. to steal the attention from them. If you and your now fiancé were alone, didn't tell anyone until after the wedding and literally nobody knew about the engagement at the time, therefore you didn't steal any attention from the ones getting married, then I would say not the jerk. This reminds me of a post where a similar thing happened at a destination wedding except the proposal was a day or two before the ceremony. They told no one and the bride and groom didn't find out until like five years later when they all returned to that same destination. 
and still the bride and groom were bent out of shape. Soft, you're the jerk, since you didn't make a big scene, but don't propose at someone else's wedding unless you have permission from the bride and groom beforehand. You have 364 other days to make a proposal. You're the jerk. It took you 10 years to make this decision? On virtually the one day it could be controversial. Over 3,650 days to choose from. I don't care if a million Redditors say not the jerk. You did your brother wrong and you know it. You're just here trying to find some validation to be the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for what he did or not? Please let us know. If there's one thing I've learned from Reddit, it's that people make way too big a deal when it comes to wedding stuff. Am I the jerk for going home right after I found out that my future mother-in-law lied about not bringing kids on this family trip? I, 33 female, am a mother of two girls who are 7 and 5. Their dad passed from cancer and it was a very hard time for both his and my family. I met my now fiancé, Jack, 36 male, two years ago. He's very sweet and adores both of them equally. However, his mom is a bit of a harsh view on single moms, especially with how low my income is compared to his. He's a doctor. I tried my best to have a good, respectful relationship with her and she started to respond positively, though I noticed that she'd excluded my kids a number of times from a number of occasions. Future mother-in-law informed us of a three-day family trip that will be a child-free event. She said it's because it involves going to bars and doing activities that aren't family-oriented. She told me I needed to leave my daughters with someone before Jack and I could come on the trip and I immediately had my sister come and stay with them at home. The trip was supposed to be by plane, three-hour flight. We were late, but Jack said he intended to arrive late so that we wouldn't have to wait for too long. I saw his mom and dad there. We talked as we waited for sister-in-law and brother-in-law. I then saw them coming towards us with their three kids behind them. I was confused. I looked at future mother-in-law and she avoided eye contact. I immediately asked sister-in-law why she brought her kids and whether she was aware that this wasn't a family-friendly trip. Sister-in-law and her husband looked confused and said there was no such thing, but I told them what future mother-in-law had told me and I didn't bring my kids. Sister-in-law didn't say anything, but her husband told me that future mother-in-law must have lied and told me this story to prevent me from bringing mine. Brother-in-law adores them and he too sees how inappropriate future mother-in-law is behaving. Sister-in-law yelled at him and I lashed out both at Jack and future mother-in-law and called her horrible, then I walked off. Jack told me to hold on for a minute, but I canceled my ticket and went home. The family had to get on the plane, and after Jack got home, we had a big fight. He said no one enjoyed the trip because I caused everyone to fight by how I reacted. I told him she excluded my daughters, but he said that his mom is entitled to her feelings, and I shouldn't expect to spring the girls on her all the time when she still doesn't consider them as close as her other grandkids. He promised me all that is going to change, and I just have to give them time and that I shouldn't have walked off and canceled my ticket like that. Not the jerk. OP, run. Why is he blaming you for ruining the trip when his mother lied? And the sister-in-law got mad at her husband, whom I assume married into the family, for exposing the lie. This family is playing the if they're not blood, they're not family card, and that is a hard stopping point to reevaluate the marriage. Not the jerk, but I would ask your husband if he considers your kids his own, because it sounds like he doesn't. Thankfully, he's only her fiancé and not her husband. Yeah, I would have cancelled Jack along with the plane ticket if he knew about the lie and said nothing. Even if he didn't know, he should have been cashing in his ticket and heading home with OP. If you don't have the back of your soon-to-be wife and kids, you don't deserve any of them. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. Do not marry into this family. Jack and future mother-in-law saw no issue with excluding your kids and then Jack had the nerve to double down and defend it. He doesn't adore your kids as much as you think he does. Take this for the red flag it is. That was my take too. He's pretending to like them. He definitely planned on arriving late, thinking she would not turn back. Boy, was he in for a surprise. Not the jerk. Future mother-in-law is a major jerk and so is Jack. Actually, I think he's worse than her. He still went on the trip and he absolutely knew this was happening from the start. That should show you just how much he actually cares about you. It's awful that she won't accept your kids as her grandkids, though I guess that she is entitled to her feelings, but that doesn't mean she gets to lie to you about the trip. Jack didn't want to be late to avoid waiting. He planned it that way so that you would be forced to stay. He probably wanted you on the plane before sister-in-law showed up and then blamed you for ruining the trip when it was his mom that lied. You and your kids deserve better.
Am I the jerk for telling my family they're not in my grandparents' trust? I'm 44, female, and I have five kids, twin boys who are 21, a daughter who's 16, another daughter who's 11, another son who's 9. I come from a large narcissistic family with my dad as the leader. I have seven other siblings that are just as narcissistic. My childhood was so rough that I went to live with my grandparents in middle school and never went back. Best decision ever. My father is my grandparents' only living kid. He nearly ran my grandfather's construction business into the ground, embezzling money, which forced my grandfather's hand to repossess his business back, which hurt him because he never expected such a thing from his own kid. This damaged their relationship. My father went on to take more money out of their personal accounts and even put them on the line for a mortgage for his home. I begged and pleaded for my grandfather to pursue charges. All he ever said was, no one will ever prosper from greed. My grandparents came out of retirement in their 70s to bring the business back to life. It was a no-brainer for me. I resigned from my job and moved back home to help them. They did the impossible and made the business a success once again, but in the same, it practically took their lives. For the last five years, I've been caregiver and running the business along with my sons alone, and it's no easy feat, but I've done it. Their papa has taught them everything he knows and they love it so much that they're going to school so that they can be fully equipped to help me more with the business. Mind you, my family hasn't reached out barely at all. We see them on holidays, if that. They didn't even call when they knew my grandparents were in the hospital. My grandmother was first to transition over. The moment word was delivered about my grandfather and the process of transitioning, that's when my father found his heart. He was here every day and in the same, this is when the disrespect started. I was subjected to listening to my parents and siblings discuss what of my grandparents would be sold and taken, who would get what, while my grandfather was laying right there in bed as they discussed this. Most times I would get up and leave the room and go cry when I should have been laughing because I knew my grandparents had left them nothing. They have an irrevocable estate trust that's solid and structured to a T. Anyhow, on the last day, my father had the audacity to tell me that he no longer needed my help at the company, that he would be taking back over. I ignored him, asked me when did I plan on moving out because he had some offers on the home, a home that has been in our family for generations. I still ignored him. Then he told me I had 30 days to move out. My mother stated they were being fair, so there was no need for my attitude. I lost it. I screamed at the top of my lungs that my grandparents hadn't left them a dime so crawl back to the hole they had crawled out of. It's been horrible ever since with all kinds of calls. Not the jerk, but you should proactively hire a lawyer to handle estate matters and to put a stop to any harassment. Also, don't let them be in the house alone ever and place cameras because they will likely take anything worth value like grandma's jewelry, etc. I'd be very careful. Definitely not the jerk. Your grandpa was right in the end but I would definitely consult a lawyer and consider a good security system with cameras inside and out. You know there will be major drama, so cover yourself. Good luck. Am I the jerk for keeping score of my husband's incompetence? I, 24 female, and my husband, 26 male, have been together for six years and we have three kids under the age of five. Yes, I had three babies in four years. Yes, I am tired. In general, my husband is a great guy, but he started doing something that really upsets me. The most recent example. On my husband's day off, he wanted to stay home and rest, so I went grocery shopping, came home, put all the groceries away, cleaned the house, he did clean our room, prepared everything for our son's birthday party the next day, and made dinner. Once dinner was over, I started tidying up, and he got down on the floor to stretch out a pain in his back. I tossed him a paper towel and said, why don't you wipe up that spill while you're down, with a smile, because I thought he would find the paper towel floating towards his head as amusing as I did, he said, no, got up and walked away. I was so frustrated as this had happened a few other times over the last week. I said, you can't just say no and walk away like that. It's very rude and disrespectful to me. I asked for help with something. He said, did you seriously just tell me I can't say no? I am a grown man. I don't need to explain things to you. You can tell me no, I can tell you no. I told him that I actually would never just be able to tell him no because he would get very upset. I also added that it's not that he can't say no, I just wish he would talk things out with me as a team, such as, no, I don't have time right now, or no, but I can get to it later. We went back and forth a few times and just ended up basically agreeing to try and listen to each other more. It really bothered me that he said I could tell him no anytime, 
as that has never been true in our relationship, so I tested it out. All day Saturday, I tried telling him no about little things. Will you make that appointment for me? No. Will you go get me a trash bag? No. Will you grab me some lunch? No. I didn't put my foot down on any of it. I just started with a no and would go to walk away and he would either reason with me, convince me, or get frustrated with me each time. And each time I would end up doing it, like I always have. The next morning he asked me to do something and I put my foot down and said I didn't want to do it and he would have to. He got really upset and asked why I was being so difficult, so I told him this. Yesterday I told you no 11 times. 11 times you got frustrated with me or did not accept the no. Not even one time did you accept my no. He said the fact I kept track and said no purposely to prove a point was toxic and if he did that with me, I would be really mad. I told him the fact I needed to keep track to prove a point was toxic when he should want to fix the situation just because it was something that bothered me. He still stands behind my behavior being toxic. So, am I the jerk for keeping track of his behavior and bringing it to his attention? Edit to add. Going to add to this because I think it's important to make clear. Him stretching out after dinner is a very normal occurrence. He wasn't in awful pain. He just had a bit of a catch in his back. I can see how this could appear disrespectful though and appreciate the feedback. I think my biggest frustration is he can say no and walk away. However, I must take care of it because I am not going to leave a mess on the floor for my kids to live with. Also, we do not fight in front of our kids and we both work to have calm communication in front of them. I strongly suggest that you are married to a narcissist because here's what happened. You went to him with ironclad proof, but are you guys talking about his behavior? No, instead you're talking about your behavior. The best defense is the good offense. You gave him proof and he came back with his own gaslighting accusation and now that's what you guys are busy talking about. In the meantime, his double standard isn't being discussed. This is what narcs do. Source, former marriage. Advice, don't have any more kids. Info, do you get any days off? Or are you mommy to four kids every day of the week? Does your husband regularly say no to your request for teamwork? Does your husband spontaneously take on tasks? Or does he need to be asked? Does your husband go out of his way to do things in service to you, your kid's upbringing, your household, or does he just go to work? OP, good question. He always keeps the kids when I ask him and he's a great father. He usually has to be asked to do most tasks at home, but he works really hard on things outside, grass, house upkeep, etc. He often does not think of ways to serve me outside of his everyday things, which bothers me, but he will usually do whatever I ask if I really need it or want it. So essentially, you bear the entire emotional and planning load of the internal household and family running while he occasionally does things outside that aren't as frequent? OP, essentially, yes. OP, I cannot tell if you are a stay-at-home mom, but you were very young when you had your first, so I think this advice still applies. I'm a stay-at-home mom and my husband works long hours in healthcare. Firstly, a marriage is supposed to make both lives happier, healthier, and easier. It requires trust, respect, equality, similar goals and values. Do you have all that? Marriage is about sharing life's burdens so both lives are improved. Does he do that? Secondly, if you are a stay-at-home mom, your husband still should be doing his fair share of childcare and housework without you needing to tell him. My husband and I established my job as a stay-at-home mom to be that of a nanny to our kids. Anything a full-time nanny position would do is what I do while my husband is at work. I play with, feed, take care, and go on adventures with the kids. Maybe throw in laundry and do day dishes. Anything else is saved for when husband gets home. Then I cook dinner, we eat dinner as a family, and we split duties at night. One does bedtime routine, one does end of day chores, wiping counters, taking out trash, night dishes, sweeping. We each get an hour every other night to rest and relax because rest is so important as well. On weekends, I do a deep clean Saturday morning while my husband spends time with our kids. It's important he gets quality time with them. In the afternoon, my husband can do his outside chores if needed, but there is always far less to do outside than inside. Along with that, my husband still does some emotional labor. Yes, I do more housework and childcare and emotional labor, but he definitely contributes. What is the split of household duties for your house? How much time do you think he spends on his chores versus yours? Finally, as a stay-at-home mom, I very strongly urge stay-at-home moms to have the following. Being a stay-at-home mom is such a vulnerable position you need financial, emotional, and physical stability. But I also think it applies to your situation even if you do work because you need to think if you're financially equals. Doing all the childcare can still put you at a financial disadvantage. Is your husband able to advance his career faster because you're busy with the kids? 
you should have access to all, or almost all, of the money in a joint bank account. Can you freely spend money on yourself, your baby, and the household within reason? Do you and your husband each have similar amounts of hobby money? If he spends $100 on games, do you get $100 for your hobbies? Do you feel you can jointly decide how money is spent and your husband will listen to your thoughts and advice? You should have six months worth of bills saved in a bank account that your husband cannot access, meaning only your name is on the account. If your husband left you tomorrow, how would you afford food and rent while trying to get back on your feet and find a job? If something happened to him, would you know how and where you would pay all the bills and be able to until you found other money? Do you have a substantial maxed out life insurance policy on your husband and yourself if either of you were to pass? How would you support your kids and yourself if he suddenly left you or passed? Do you have career training and a career you plan to return to after your baby enters school? How could you financially support yourself if needed tomorrow? Re-entering the workforce can be difficult, especially without an education. You deserve to have an ability to support yourself if something were to happen to your husband or your relationship. You deserve a safety net for yourself and your kids. Do you have a retirement account? If you're a stay-at-home mom, has your husband opened a retirement account in your name? By working, he probably automatically has retirement accounts, but you should have some for yourself as well. Finally, do you have family and friend support? Can your family financially, physically, mentally, and emotionally support you if anything went south in your relationship? Can you live with them and have help caring for your kids while you readjust? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for telling my sister I didn't ask for us to be sisters any more than she did? My sister is 24 and I'm 26, female. She's getting married and this was a fight over wedding stuff, but it's an ongoing issue. She always had the idea that a big sister is meant to be your best friend, protector, is meant to put you first, take care of you, spoil you rotten and adore you. I was a letdown for her in that regard. I loved her of course, but I wasn't devoted to her and I never thought she was the best thing in my life. Over the years, she's tried to make me be the sister she's always wanted me to be. She's asked me to cancel my plans with friends. She'd give me a list of sister gifts I could buy her. She'd invite herself along to my plans, etc. We fought about it a lot. When she turned 17 and I didn't want to take her on vacation, she lost it with me and told me I was a horrible big sister and I never deserved the job. After she got engaged, she asked her best friend to be her maid of honor and two of her close friends to be bridesmaids. Unknown to me was the fact that she wanted me to be upset she didn't ask me. She expected me to confront her and say I wanted to be maid of honor. She brought up wedding stuff at our parents' house and mentioned her bridesmaids. When I didn't comment about it, she asked me how I could be such a jerk. She said I'm her sister and I should be the maid of honor. That I should be hurt she didn't ask me. She wanted to know why I hadn't asked her. I told her to calm down, that it was her wedding and she could have whoever she wanted, that it wasn't my wedding or my business. That started her off on a tangent about how I'm evil. She said it was the only thing that could explain being such an awful older sister. She listed all the stuff I should have done throughout our lives as her big sister, all the duties I had towards her, and how I was nothing but a disappointment and she hated having me as a big sister. It upset me so much to expect so much of me like I'm her parent. I told her I didn't ask for us to be sisters any more than she did and that siblings are not parents, even when they're older and it's not our job to cater to younger siblings every whim. She burst into tears. She told our parents I was being mean. They said nothing, not one darn thing to either of us. She told me I was being the biggest jerk in the world for saying something like that. Am I the jerk? God help the poor person she's roped into marrying her if these are the kinds of games she thinks are acceptable to play. Not the jerk. OP, I feel bad for her future oldest kid most of all. I know she wants them, that will be an impossible burden for them to carry through their lives. Not the jerk. She wanted you to be hurt that she didn't choose you as maid of honor and it backfired spectacularly. She needs to get over her childish ideas that sisters are best friends and that you're her guardian angel. She's the jerk for trying to manipulate you. Am I the jerk for being upset that my fiance got me the ring I wanted? Not sure how to start this, so I'll jump into it. My fiance has been asking me what I want for my engagement ring for close to a year. I've sent him reference photos at his request. He's asked me to explicitly state which carrot I want and what carrot my family would find acceptable. Don't ask, they're a bit materialistic and overbearing, one of the reasons I moved away from them. I told him repeatedly what my ideal would be, but emphasized that I would be happy with anything from him because it would be a symbol of his love and commitment. I always knew he makes enough money to buy an impressive ring, but I don't think it's right to put that pressure on him. 
Fast forward to two weeks ago. He ended up proposing with a ring that was completely different than what we discussed. The metal was different, the cut, design, etc. He told me it was a family heirloom. I was thrown off because he never mentioned it before. Regardless, I was over the moon, not only at the thought of marrying him, but so flattered that his family wanted to give me something so sentimental. Obviously, I said yes, and I can only imagine I appeared as ecstatic as I felt. I took the ring and I was overjoyed. He paused for a moment and was confused, but kind of recovers and we went on about our normal lives. I've been talking about how happy I was to have something so meaningful from his family for the past two weeks. Well, yesterday, he sheepishly came to me and gave me exactly the ring we had talked about. At first, I was gutted. I thought his family no longer wanted me to have a part of their history. So he clarified that the first ring wasn't an heirloom, it was something he bought as a joke and he was expecting a reaction out of me. And he was shocked he didn't get one and didn't know what to do when I was so happy with the first ring. I was floored. In that moment, I was so confused and had so many conflicting feelings I couldn't process in real time that I didn't know what to say. I just walked out of the room. He now is saying that I ruined our proposal and wedding story by walking away and shutting him out when he gave me an expensive ring. He is genuinely upset at me for not being stoked. He pranked me initially. Am I the jerk for being disappointed and confused? Wow, you are absolutely not the jerk at all, but your fiancé is a massive, shockingly immature one. What's wrong with him? It's horrifying enough that he's so childish that he thought that turning his marriage proposal to you into some sort of a prank on you in any way was appropriate. But to then try to blame you for not being thrilled when you found out he thought what should have been one of the most special moments of both of your lives and making an actual literal joke out of it? I can't imagine feeling anything but betrayed and furious. Clearly you're not the jerk, but you have bigger problems. This man not only can't read a room, he can't be serious even about the most meaningful moments of your relationship and he cannot and will not consider your feelings, even above his need to play childish games. Are you sure this is someone you want to build a life with? Because he's showing you who he is, and it's not someone reliable or considerate. I was confused as you are while reading this. Saying the ring is an heirloom obviously has more meaning, especially if he knew you were not materialistic, unlike your family. He didn't think his prank through and was upset your reaction wasn't exactly that of someone who was pranked. I'm guessing he waited for a few days just to see if you would show different feelings about the ring, which didn't happen. It's actually funny if he had a better sense of humor. Had he taken the time to explain his prank and not blame his failure on you, you both would have gotten over it and had a good laugh. Not the jerk, by the way. You literally did nothing wrong. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her fiancé? Please let us know. Every day I think how thankful I am that I don't know any pranksters like the ones we read about in these stories. Neighbors kept parking in our space. I froze them out. This happened around 20 years ago. Our family owned two apartment buildings, three units each. We lived in two of them, rented out the other four. There's nothing but these three flats lining both sides of the road for about a mile. Not all have parking. On the side streets are houses and very little street parking. We had more land than most of these units since it was also our home. So we had parking for around 16 cars. Everything was fine for literally decades. Then cars started appearing in our parking lot that were not our tenants. I blocked one in one day, went outside to see this jerk driving through our bushes and cutting across the yard to get out. I called the cops, nothing they could do. So I called a tow company and I had them put up signs. We'd have to call them to have a car towed. The signs seemed to work, no more random cars. Until New Year's Eve one year. I arrive home and every space is filled. There are even cars on the street blocking in the other cars. I'm beyond upset. I call the tow company. They can't do anything for a few hours because they're so busy. We're in the Chicago suburbs. It's below zero out. I have an idea. I dig out the lawn sprinklers and hoses. I run one hose inside to the laundry room faucet and turn on the hot water. This way, the hose and sprinklers won't ice up. But the cars and ground sure did. Three sprinklers moved every half hour or so for almost five hours. Every car, every square inch of the parking lot, the street by the cars, encased in ice. I made a point to spray ice in the locks, between the window seals and glass, in the grills, put away the sprinklers and hoses, went to bed. 4 a.m., furious pounding on the doors, doorbells ringing nonstop. We just smiled and called the cops, waited until they arrived and went outside. Cops were holding back laughter, these people were told to park here by their friend who owned an apartment several buildings away. 
the same idiot who drove over our bushes. I pointed to the tow sign and told the people to move their cars or get towed. In our town, cops can ticket on private property with the owner's permission, so all cars were ticketed. They were also towed since nobody could get in their vehicles. Wish we had it on video. Am I the jerk for telling my fiancé she's not the breadwinner if she's not paying the bills? My fiancé and I moved in together shortly before we got engaged. Before we did, we discussed how we'd split the housework and bills, 50-50 down the middle with some wiggle room for when the other needs help. When we moved, it was into her parents' two-story garage that they converted into basically an apartment. They offered a low rent, $700 total, and pitch in for the electric and internet so we could save money for our own place and wedding. My fiancé earns more than me, and that's cool. I'm proud of her. Before we moved in together, it always seemed like she was living paycheck to paycheck, and I chalked it up to the apartment she had prior having insane high rent. She stuck to the 50-50 arrangement at first concerning bills, but she missed often, and I had to remind her about it. Post-engagement, she's back to living paycheck to paycheck, either missing or very late with her part of the rent monthly. The two utilities we pay, groceries, late with her car payment, her parents have talked to me multiple times about rent, and I've covered her missing portion to get us caught up, and then tried talking to her. It always turns into her saying we should just move if her parents are going to hound us. I told her we're lucky it's her parents, because anywhere else they would have kicked us out by now. On top of that, I pay my own bills, do about 65% of the housework, arrange and pay for most of our dates and vacations, gifts for her, pay most towards our pets. I've suggested a financial coach, but what kicks me is whenever we're around others, she boasts about being the breadwinner since she earns more. Goes on about the stress of being the main source of income, all the hours she has to work to pay all of our bills. I was letting it slide until a few days ago when we were at a get-together. She and her sister started up again about her being the breadwinner. Her sister said something to the effect of her ex-boyfriend had a hard time being with someone who earned more, and my fiancé went, Good thing OP doesn't mind me bringing home the pay. I told her just because she earns more doesn't make her the breadwinner when she blows it all on herself and I'm paying most of the bills. She's embarrassed now and keeps saying I made her look bad and I got her in trouble with her parents because they want to see what she spends her money on each month, but I don't think I did anything wrong. Am I the jerk? Update. 11 last night I was ready to just postpone the engagement. As of this morning, after a lot of talking and things coming to light, we are broken up. Thank you everyone for your responses and input especially those who encouraged looking deeper. Quick summary. She felt a joint account would impede her financial independence. She insisted we could afford her purchases based off of our total income. Her parents were under the impression she was also paying off my student loans, my car, my phone, and paying for our vacations. She didn't get evicted from her last apartment, but she was late with her rent often enough that they weren't going to renew her lease, so she didn't suggest us moving to a bigger apartment at her building. Biggest, nope, I'm out. The monthly take-home amount she told me was what she earned before wage garnishment kicked in, in addition to mass debt. She's been doing some online stuff to make up for the money she lost due to that. Yes, I got the ring back. Again, thank you everyone, but I will not be responding to any more comments. I'm going to take some time for myself and get things figured out. Not the jerk. Though, you're focusing on the wrong problem. Forget perception. You need to sort out her financial irresponsibility before you marry or things aren't going to get better. OP, I have put the brakes on any more wedding planning until she either sees a financial coach or a therapist to figure out what's up with her way of doing things. What does she spend it all on? OP, I know some of what she spends it on, going out for lunch, different hair and skin products, accessories for her car, house decor, pretty much anything she sees that she feels she needs to have right then and there. Yep, that's a problem. That's not going to get better with time. I think you taking a stand about financial education is a wise move. I agree. Before I was able to get my ADHD under control, I would blow lots of money on the absolutely dumbest things because I felt like I needed it. Looking back, it was purely a serotonin boost to make myself feel better about whatever I was dealing with at the time. I'm going to hop on here and give you insight as someone who married into that exact situation. My ex-husband financially ruined us. By the time we divorced, I was over 12 grand in debt on one credit card alone. He made over $120,000 a year and couldn't help pay bills. At the time, I made 32,000 a year. You can see how this would be stressful. 
It caused us to absolutely tear each other apart. It took me years to straighten my finances out. Never again. Never ever marry someone who has zero money management skills. It sounds like you're very aware and making the right decisions. If she absolutely cannot stop spending the way she is, you may need to cut her loose. Money is one of the biggest factors in divorce. Can absolutely second this. My ex-husband was horrendous with money. Add that to his inability to not get fired from every job he had due to his attitude problem, it left me to cover everything. When he did get a job, instead of working to pay off the debts we had accumulated in the nine months he had been unemployed, he had spent all his money on expensive stuff we just didn't need. Bigger TVs, game consoles, holidays. Then he had overspend and not have enough left to pay the mortgage, so again, I had to cover it. Out of fear of losing our house, I had to keep borrowing money just to keep us above water, and by the time we separated, I had 25,000 pounds of debt in my name. He had debts even higher than mine, but honestly, I don't know what he was spending it on. I found out months later that he had also had friends take out massive loans for him, over 20,000 pounds over the years, and I have absolutely no idea where that money went. I still got 18,000 pounds to pay off. It's going to take me years. Never again. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his fiance? Please let us know. If you understand how money works, don't marry someone who doesn't. You want me to search for non-existent products? Got it. Three years ago, I was working in a popular local cafe in the middle of a big city. Obviously, there were a lot of customers during rush hours and, of course, the usual Karens. At the time of this story, I was just finishing my training to be fully hired. The manager, Steve, was an utterly obnoxious person who was overall very disturbing. He'd tell us to do something, then change his mind while we were halfway through it. Anyways, he wasn't exactly competent, but we were low on staff and the owner desperately needed a manager. So this one day, I'm just clocking in, and I see my first clients are a bunch of kids and they're caring of a mom. Yes, she had the haircut. The following conversation ensued. Karen, what are your muffin flavors? Me, we have, and I name all the muffin flavors. Karen interrupts me. No, no, I'll just take one of those special edition muffins. Points to the back of the kitchen, like she's expecting me to make them for her. Me, oh, sorry, those are limited edition muffins. We don't have them anymore. Karen rolls her eyes. Yeah, yeah, I know, just give me five of them. Me, a bit louder, thinking she didn't hear me. We don't have those anymore, ma'am. I'm sorry. Just give me them. What's wrong with you? Get me your manager. Now, at this point, I'm pretty upset because this woman is screaming at the top of her lungs and gathering all of the attention towards her. So, I do as she asked, and I get her the manager. Steve looks mad as soon as I disturb him. He goes to see the Karen and comes back to me. Steve, just give her the muffins, now. Me, we don't have any of those muffins left. I already explained that to her. There are some left. Just find them. Me. Where are they? I'm pretty positive we don't have any left. Steve. I don't care about your opinion. Just go find them already. Ask others to help you find them if you're that dumb. And don't go back to that lady or any other clients until you find those muffins. Me. Thinking about what he just said. Okay, sir. I'll give her the muffins. Steve. That's better. So I go and try to find them everywhere in the store. Of course, there are none left as the muffins are seasonal items and since none arrived in stock, there are no special edition muffins left. Cue malicious compliance. Since Steve told me to not go back to that lady or any other clients until I found the muffins, I do exactly that. Since he also told me to ask others for help, I make sure to let every employee know my desperate need for help in finding the muffins. In the end, since no one liked Steve anyways, we all went searching for the muffins. For several hours, clients kept pouring in until one of them dared to ask what we were all doing running around. I calmly explained that our manager sent us searching for something and we couldn't work until we found it. I insisted that our hands were tied and we couldn't serve them until our manager said so. Every single client went banging on Steve's door demanding to talk to him. As soon as he opened the door, everyone started yelling at him to let the employees serve them. Visibly confused by so many people in the cafe and in front of him, he shouted my name. I wasn't allowed to stop searching, so I replied by yelling back too. He eventually came in front of me and asked me what was going on. The following conversation was priceless. Me. Oh, I was just searching for the muffins. Steve, looking like he was about to pass out. 
What? Why? Me. Well, you asked me to find them or to get help if needed. You insisted I shouldn't go serve anyone until I find them. Since we never found them, we never got to work again. Steve, realizing he just lost hours of profits. Seriously? Go back to work, now. Me, with a smug look on my face. But we didn't find the muffins yet, sir. Would you like to search with us? Steve went ballistic on me, saying that this was insubordination, that I had the IQ of a slug, etc. Meanwhile, the Karen sent multiple complaints to the owner about the manager. At the end of the day, the owner personally came in to announce to Steve that he was fired and replaced by one of my coworkers. We never had any other seasonal muffins after that. Speaking of muffins, what's your favorite flavor muffin of all time? Please let us know. I gotta go with the double chocolate, bruh. Mmm, yes. Am I the jerk for canceling a girl's appointment the day of her baby shower? I, female 17, am a part-time braider and I take my job very seriously because this is how I make money and this is what I want to do for my career. I work from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. on weekdays and 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekends. School is my first priority and on weekends, enjoying my weekend is important too. I have my policy on my booking link, so before you even book an appointment, you have to read my policy. A couple policies I have are no show equals no further appointments, 30 minutes grace period. After that, your appointment will be canceled. No extra people, etc., etc. Most of my clients respect my rules and always come through. This girl, Tiffany, booked an appointment with me for June 4th at 3 p.m. She was getting a wig installed. No braid down, just application. So I had another client right after her for braids. If you wear braids or do braids, you know braids can take hours. Braids already take hours, plus she booked a takedown and shampoo, so that's extra time. It came time for Tiffany's appointment, so I was setting everything up for her and 3 p.m. came and she wasn't there. I have a 30 minute grace period, so I wasn't worried. After 15 minutes, I texted her and asked was she still coming and never received a text back. It was going on 3.45, so I just took it as a no-show and put all my stuff away and started getting the stuff ready for my next client. I texted Tiffany and told her her appointment was canceled, but she could come pick up her wig. It was customized and everything for free. All she needed was someone else to install it for her. I never received a text back. My next client came around 4.30 and I started working on her head. Maybe around 5.30ish, my mom called me and told me I had a client at the door. I work out of my house and to come see what she was getting at because she was cutting up outside. I stopped in the middle of my client's hair to go see who it was and it was Tiffany. She was losing it on me, saying I ruined her baby shower and why was her appointment cancelled? So I explained to her my policy and that she wasn't just 30 minutes late or even an hour late. She was two hours late and I couldn't do her hair anymore. I gave her a wig and sent her on her way. She started talking about me on social media and everybody in the comments are dragging me down, saying I'm unprofessional and to not book with me when I've been nothing but professional. If you can't respect me and my rules, you just won't get your hair done by me. There's plenty of other hairstylists where we stay. My mom said I'm not wrong, but I'm getting a lot of messages and she's getting a lot of comments on her post talking about how unprofessional I'm being when I did nothing but respect her and her time. I've even had a client cancel an appointment after seeing her post. I'm losing money and clients over this petty mess, and I know I'm not wrong. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. She was two hours late for her appointment. You don't exist to fix whatever works best for her schedule or work at her beck and call. I would be inclined to make a comment responding to her. Dear Tiffany, I do my best to accommodate clients and their busy schedules. However, clients are made aware prior to booking their appointment of my policy concerning appointment cancellation for those who are more than half an hour late to their appointment's time. You were over two hours late and did not respond to my attempt to reach you. I had to attend to clients whose appointments were after yours. As a show of good faith, I provided you with your wig already styled at no cost. I am disappointed you were left with such a negative impression of my business despite my best attempts to work with you. Don't forget to show screenshots of you trying to text her about her appointment along with timestamps. If people are your clients, they should know your policy. Not the jerk. She was two hours late. There is no professional who takes clients two hours late without issues. She didn't even reach out to tell you that she was delayed. As a fellow hairstylist, absolutely not the jerk. Your clients also need to respect your time and your business 
and it's not your problem when she A. didn't communicate and B. was two hours late. Forget that noise. I'm so sorry it's negatively affecting your business, but you don't have to bend over backwards to accommodate people who show you no respect. Absolutely not. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Tiffany? Please let us know. Tiffany? I think I had breakfast with her once. How do I tell my parents they still owe me $10,000? Ever since I could start making money, I started saving. By the time I was 16 years old, I had bought my first car, which was $1,700, with cash, and I still had $1,500 in a savings account with a full-time job and a second part-time job. My parents had full access to this account because I was still a minor. When I was 17, my family took a trip that my parents couldn't afford. They asked me if they could use some of my savings and said they would pay me back. I agreed. Little did I know that they would use that as permission to take money out regularly. Hundreds of dollars every month for three years. When I finally realized, I stopped putting money in that account, opened a checking account, and a new savings account at a different bank. The last time they took money out was August of last year. I was 20 at the time. I work for them as well, and many times I would just not get paid. I always kept track of that, and I still know the exact amount they missed. I always kept track of how much I should have had, in writing, every check, every payment, and every withdrawal I made. I knew exactly how much I should have had in my account, and it was well over $10,000. And with that money, I wanted a new car. $18,000 was the cost, and by selling my other car, I had enough and then some. Or so I thought. When I went to check out how much was in my first savings account, it was empty. I had nothing in the account. There should have been $10,000 or more, and it was empty. I went straight to my parents and told them I wanted this new vehicle and asked them to help me pay for it because they still owed me money. They were reluctant at first and denied owing me so much, but I practically begged for them to help me. They finally did and paid the remainder of my work money, $3,000, and they bought my old car from me for $5,000. I paid the rest with the money from my new savings account. I moved out last October, and when I brought up the money they owed me, I was told they don't owe me more than $1,000 because they paid for my phone and car insurance while I was living with them, and they helped pay for my newest car. We never had rules about my bills, they just paid for it without a word. I'm okay with deducting that from the total, but I'd rather not. It was money I made fairly, and they never told me I had to pay them anything, and I did offer. As for the car, they only paid off my work money, not even the money they took from me. In total, they owe me over $10,000. I have no idea how to bring this up and how I could even win this battle. I'm looking to buy a house and have a wedding soon. That extra money would be extremely helpful and our relationship is still rocky since I moved out. I don't want to make things worse, but it is a lot of money that I kind of need. I would bet that since they probably set it up and their name was on the account, they were legally able to take money out. It depends on if you really want or need to have a relationship with them. Pushing it will probably end the relationship and you will still be out of the money. Good luck on whatever you decide. I agree with him. Suing will destroy your relationship with your parents. I would confront them with your pile of evidence. Realize your parents are both bad with money and don't have good boundaries. This will never change. It's who they are. The issue of them owing you $10,000 may never get resolved. It's a hard day when you realize mom and dad are not all of what you thought or wanted or needed. Can you live with this? I think you should call this one a win. You know never to loan them money in the future, no matter what they promise, and that they aren't above stealing from you. Keep your stuff protected and take a loss on what they still owe you. A lawsuit is the only real answer, and that's not worth the five-ish thousand they owe you, especially since you seem to be really, really good with money. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you sue your parents for the $10,000 they owed you or not? Please let us know. I'd consider doing what my friend Lizzie did. They made a song about her. Am I the jerk for telling my wife that putting our son to bed was now her job and then moving my bed into a separate room? The situation is basically that I, 35 male, and my wife, 29 female, have a two-year-old son. She is a stay-at-home mom and I work full-time, usually from 6.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. or so. Being a toddler, my son should generally be sleeping between 11 and 14 hours a day. Therefore, what my wife and I aim for is for him to wake up at 7 a.m., do all the typical daily activities, take a nap starting between 1.30 p.m. and 2 p.m. for two hours, and then go to bed again at 8 p.m. This would give him a good 13 hours of sleep a day. 
I'm typically in charge of getting him to sleep at night while she obviously puts him down for his afternoon nap. For the past several months, my wife has gotten incredibly lazy with putting him to bed. I understand that it's not always easy, but she has essentially worked out a new system. She waits for him to be utterly exhausted at about 4 p.m., puts him in bed, and then wakes him up between 6 and as late as 6.30. Therefore, when I try to get him to go to bed between 8 and 9, he's not tired. At all. It's basically a horrible wrestling match to get him to go to sleep as he shrieks and bites and doesn't want to sleep because he's simply not tired. It takes me up to two and a half hours to get him to go to sleep, which is horribly unfun for both of us. Last night, I finally told my wife that until she fixes his sleep schedule, I'm not going to clean up her mess anymore. I moved my bed into another room, locked the door, and went to bed as she put him to sleep. This morning, she was exhausted from doing so and in a terrible mood because apparently having to do what I've been doing for months was bad. She told me that I need to be more active in helping out with him and I responded that I'll happily do so once she actually gets him down for his nap at a reasonable time. I honestly don't think I'm out of line here, but am I being a jerk? Not the jerk. Toddler is a difficult age. Their needs are constantly changing. He might not be tired at 1.30 to 2 anymore, but your wife is still trying to get him down, which he can't take much longer if he's not tired, as you well know from the nighttime struggles. Sounds like he's starting to transition out of the daily nap phase. It's a hard milestone on the parents because toddler will get tired without a nap, but too close to bedtime, so you either have to deal with a cranky toddler in the evenings until this passes, or do an earlier bedtime, which will cause the kiddo to get up early. Please be patient with each other. Raising a kid is hard on both parents. This is the answer. Skip the daytime nap and put him to bed earlier in the evening. Napping isn't helping anymore and lots of kids grow out of daytime naps, especially when home all day versus childcare centers. You're the jerk. Your kid is having some typical sleep struggles. Your wife isn't being lazy with his naps. It sounds like she's having a hard time getting him to actually go to sleep. You're blaming her instead of acting like a parent and trying to work out a solution together. If anyone's being lazy here, it's you. Right? It seems like kids go through nap struggles all the time. I imagine this kid throws the same tantrum at 1.30 that he's doing at 8, hence the pushed back nap time. Kids aren't clocks, sir. Seems extremely unfair to call her lazy when I can only imagine she is trying. You're the jerk. Parenting requires constant communication. To lock her out at 8 p.m. is wild. Let's not even mention that you really only see your kid between the hours of 5.30 to 8 p.m., which isn't fair division of labor if she's a stay-at-home mom. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or his wife? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for blowing up at my fiancé for giving my future mother-in-law our wedding coordinator's number? My fiancé, Edgar, is my future mother-in-law's only son. She's so attached to him and is excited for our wedding. We've had a relatively long engagement and we're finally getting married soon. I've been trying to keep her involved as much as possible, but she just kept getting further with her expectations. She'd email me lists of questions about five or six times a week. She'd ask me the same questions over and over, expecting a different answer. When she doesn't get a different answer, my future father-in-law will call me and start pushing the same thing. It's made me anxious and stressed out. Edgar says that she just wants to make sure the wedding is flawless and felt like some of the choices I made during wedding planning were poor. She went to our former wedding coordinator and bombarded her with tens of questions and even called her many times trying to change things we've already picked out, saying all choices made were based on zero experience and wrong. She even pretended to be me at some point. This caused a huge fight between us and I ended up starting all over with a new wedding coordinator and completely getting future mother-in-law out of wedding planning process. Future mother-in-law lashed out at me for it and Edgar said that I was being too hard on his mom. Last week, I found out that he went against my wishes and gave his mom our wedding coordinator contact info, and his mom ended up finding out about all of our plans. I blew up at him and told him he violated my boundaries and betrayed my trust. He said it was no big deal and that his mom genuinely means no harm, even if her and I don't agree most of the time. We had an argument and I went to stay with my dad for a few days. Edgar kept texting saying I was overreacting and that I was being too hard on him and his mom. Am I overreacting? Note, she isn't contributing anything to the wedding except her input and experience. My dad is the one paying for the wedding. He never tried to give me an opinion or suggest anything regarding the wedding. He just told me to have the wedding as I had always envisioned it. Welcome to your new life. 
Expect her to help organizing every aspect of her son's life in the future. If you're lucky, you might get to have some small bit of input as a concession, but it looks as if you are marrying two people. This comment 100%. Tip of the iceberg, OP. Yes, this is the trailer. Do you really want to see this film? If you're not prepared to leave, and he's not prepared to learn to set boundaries or understand why that's important, people do learn to live with spouses like this. They cope with having their wishes disrespected, their lives controlled. They learn to lie. They learn to evade. They learn to lean more heavily on their social support systems to make their friends a refuge from their romantic relationship and normalize the idea that a romantic relationship should be this stifling, stressful thing that requires a refuge. It's a pretty common predicament, and I'm sure you could make a long list of people in your life who have made it, if you sat down and thought about it. Before you commit to that life, sit down and think about all the huge decisions that come up in the course of a marriage, ones where you now know your own wishes about your own life would be disregarded. Your kids, their health care, their education, financial issues like who works, whose career gets prioritized, major purchases, budgets. Consider too that you're not just making this decision for you. If you're bringing kids into this dynamic, it will cast a long shadow over their lives. You will want to ask them to be your confidants and co-conspirators at a young age because you entered a marriage where you can't communicate directly with your spouse. They will resent that but still internalize that dishonesty and disrespect are central components of family life and have dysfunctional romantic relationships of their own. And that's without even getting into whatever decisions mother-in-law wants to make about their upbringing, ones you'll have to either accept or lie convincingly about and get your kids to do the same. It's not the worst life in the world, plenty of people do it, but make the decision with clear eyes. Is it just me or do weddings seem to bring out the worst in people? Am I the jerk for embarrassing a customer who refused to get out of my checkout line? I, 20 male, work part-time at my dad's grocery store. Usually if it gets too busy, we open up the express lane for customers that are buying 12 items or less. Of course, we get those customers that don't bother to read the two big signs right at checkout that say this is for 12 items or less, and they try to ignore other workers until they put everything on the conveyor belt. I usually tell them to get out of the line and refuse to check out their groceries so they move somewhere else. Not always. I'd say for me, there's been like two times where this happens. Yesterday, this one guy had a whole cart full of groceries. I was scanning items from the lady in front of him, but said out loud that this is the express lane and he's going to have to go to another line. He completely ignored me. Called him again to say the same thing and he was nodding at me but still taking everything out of his cart. So I already knew he was trying to be slick ignoring me, so I ended up scanning his stuff anyways. After finishing with the lady in front of him, again I told him to take his stuff to the other line. He gets mad at me saying to just do it already, but I'm upset. There were already a couple of people that came in to wait in line behind him. He told me he's had a long day and to just please not make it harder on him and to do my job. So in that moment I just decided forget it. I closed that register and told everyone behind him to move to the next line so I could help them there. So he was basically left there alone, but I could hear him quietly saying something, putting everything back in the cart again to go to another line, and obviously everyone was watching him too. One of my coworkers said he was talking a lot of crap for me being so unprofessional and he didn't deserve to be treated that way in front of everyone. He spoke with one of the managers, but they basically told him the same thing, that he wasn't supposed to be in that line in the first place. However, the reason I'm asking if I'm the jerk is because one of my coworkers said that I should have just let him do it since the whole thing really bothered the guy. My dad doesn't take crap from customers and he'll back up another employee if they need to. So that's the attitude I have about it too. But since it did make someone else's day harder, since he said he was already having a bad day, does that make me a jerk since I really could have let it slide but I didn't? From a customer point of view, I applaud you and I would have paid extra just to watch you put him in his place. It annoys me to no end that customers ignore what is going on around them and considering those waiting in lines behind him would have been quietly upset at him for being so special. Good on you. Great job. Well done. I caught my fiancé using my debit card without my permission to purchase stuff on Amazon for his brother. My fiancé's brother, Chris, moved to Mississippi from our hometown two years ago to be with some girl he met on the internet. Chris has always been the type to make terrible life choices and my fiancé is always the one who bails him out, with the exception of my future mother-in-law. My fiancé does this because he has survivor's guilt. They lived with their father growing up 
and their father hated Chris, for whatever reason, but loved my fiancé, Heath, so Heath saw a lot. Yes, they both got out, but Chris was ruined, refuses therapy, gets into trouble constantly, etc. He's 33, and my fiancé is 28. So when Chris left to go to Mississippi, I was working at the hospital 70 hours a week while Heath stayed home with the kids. He had no income, but he was a stay-at-home dad, and this worked for us. However, I started noticing money going missing quite often, and when I checked the bank statements, Heath handled them because he was an accountant for a couple years and better at budgeting, I noticed a ton of Amazon purchases and money transfers through Facebook Pay. When I confronted him, he told me his brother and this chick didn't work out, so he was helping him with like hotel stays, food, essentials, etc. It's important to note that during this time, I was upset because of how much money was being spent and limited him on what he could send his brother a month because it's not my responsibility, so I didn't make him stop, but I limited him. Well, budget cuts went through my hospital two months ago and I was cut, along with 340 other employees. Four wings were closed down, mine being one of them, so I'm currently unemployed. Heath works constantly now. I also got my taxes back. We have three kids. I got back a big chunk of money. Last night, Chris calls and Heath shuts the bedroom door, I assume because the kids were being loud, but I walked in roughly 10 minutes later and see Heath has my debit card in hand typing in the info on Amazon to buy his brother over $400 worth of crap. Books, board games, playing cards, etc. Nothing he needed. I ripped the debit card out of his hand and asked him what on earth he was doing and he just looks at me like I'm a jerk and asks why I had the nerve to do that. I told him I'm not fishing out $400 worth of crap to his brother and he goes, my brother has nothing to do and this is the only way I can help and said since I got a ton of money, I should be willing to help, especially considering he gets his paycheck Friday and can make up for it. I still said no. He's now saying I'm a controlling jerk. Not the jerk. I'd be getting a new card and lock down the old one, change passwords, everything. If your fiance can't be responsible, then leave. I would stop using a debit card entirely. Credit cards offer much better protection against fraudulent purchases. Yeah, that's because you're giving the bank the powers to turn your life upside down. Not the jerk. You need to have a hard talk with your husband. He needs to stop this behavior or you walk. That money could have been put towards your kid's future instead of giving it to your brother-in-law to set on fire. If he can't see the error in his ways, it's a marriage ender. He's literally taking from his own kids to give to his brother. This is 100% how she needs to put it when talking to him about the issue. That $400 you spent on your brother's non-essential entertainment could have been $133 in a college fund for each of your kids. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her fiancé? Please let us know. Nothing's worse than people who try to spend your money on things you don't approve of without your permission. Am I the jerk for leaving a wedding early as a bridesmaid and causing the wedding to get charged a $500 cleanup fee? I, Jane, 21 female, was one of Vanessa's three bridesmaids and her wedding was held at a remote lodge venue up on a mountain. When everyone got to the lodge, we did a dry run of the ceremony and surveyed the place. I assumed that the men would go to their cabin and the women would go to ours and we'd relax before the wedding. Instead, the men immediately headed to the liquor store and the groom and bride's mothers began ordering the bridesmaids to move furniture into place. That night, the women did everything from dragging 250 chairs out of the shed and setting them up to hauling furniture down two flights of stairs and positioning it in other places. Because I was the tallest and strongest person in the group, it was mostly on me to haul the larger pieces around and the mother and mother-in-law of the bride largely stood around talking about details with her. I asked repeatedly if the groom and groomsmen could be called to help, but was told that we didn't need to bother them, and that they're out unwinding before the big day. The father of the bride has a heart condition, and the father-in-law was much older and walking with a cane, so he couldn't help out either. At the end of two very sweaty hours, I had splinters, blisters, I was covered in sweat, but everything set up. During the wedding, I learned that the bride and groom were trying to avoid all of the set-up and takedown fees from the venue. The groom's mother condescendingly patted me on the arm and said that everything would be okay because Jane's our workhorse. After a bit more conversation, I found that the plan was for the bride and groom to leave and then the bridesmaids and groomsmen to stick around doing everything from cleaning up trash to moving the furniture back where we'd gotten it. Toward the end of the party, almost everyone had left 
and I realized that two of the groomsmen were so drunk that they were going to be useless, and it would again be on the bridesmaids to clean up and put all of the furniture back up the stairs. I went to tell the bride goodbye. Judging from her slightly panicked expression and, Oh, you're leaving? You're leaving now? Questions. I realized that she definitely expected me to move the furniture back, but didn't want to say anything while surrounded by people. So I left, and my phone blew up as I was driving back down the mountain. The other bridesmaids were texting me, and then Vanessa's mother left me an angry voicemail about how I was bailing on my duties as a bridesmaid. The next day I woke up to a massive paragraph from Vanessa that said it was my fault that they had to pay the $500 cleanup fee because they weren't able to get everything put back in time. So for this, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. If the wedding party is going to be doing this kind of work, you should have been asked in advance. You can't demand your wedding party do heavy labor like that because you want to be a cheapskate. You can ask, but you can't just expect and demand. Dear Vanessa, I'm so disappointed that you expected me to clean up without even asking me. The groomsmen were not even asked to help set up and clearly no one asked them to stay sober enough to clean up, which makes me think that you expected me but no one else to clean up. That's really just hurtful. I thought I was your friend and feeling used really hurts. Am I the jerk for lashing out at my ex-husband for wanting to move away with his girlfriend and my kids? I'm female, 35, and my ex-husband, male, 34, we divorced two years ago. We have two kids together who are seven and five. We decided to not have the court involved in custody at all, with us mutual agreeing that the kids would stay with him and his girlfriend in our old house together on the weekdays and attend school in the suburbs. After we divorced, I moved to the city, about 30 minutes away, and picked them up every Friday night and spend the weekends with them. For the past two years, co-parenting has run pretty smoothly. We occasionally do things with our kids, have special events, or during their birthdays. Sometimes his girlfriend comes along, and we're able to have a cordial relationship with one another. Okay, so this is where the dilemma begins. Last Friday, when I came to pick up the kids, he invites me inside to talk. Basically, he says that since he's probably going to work from home indefinitely, he wants to move to his family property with his girlfriend and the kids three hours away in rural Wisconsin. He plans on taking the kids out of public school and have his girlfriend and his sister, who currently lives there, homeschool them. This was a plan he had originally mentioned to me back when we were together, but I had reservations moving to a rural town with my career and being close to good school districts. I am also strongly against homeschooling and believe that it does not prepare kids for proper socialization skills in the future. I want an honest evaluation of whether I'm the jerk in this situation, so I will tell you exactly how it went. As soon as I hear this, I lash out at him, saying that if he wanted to move there so badly, he should just start a new family and leave me with the kids instead. I also tell him that this is a sick attempt to take the kids away from me. At this point, I'm enraged, so I start yelling and ask him if his girlfriend and his sister are even qualified to teach them properly, how they're going to socialize and make friends, and why he would want to change things all of a sudden when our co-parenting was going so well. All he has to say is, I knew you were going to react this way. I told him that I will lawyer up and make it unbelievably hard for him to go through with this. I took the kids for my weekend with them, barely unable to compose myself for most of the time. I feel awful for having my kids see me in a state like this, but I want them to grow up knowing that I will fight for them. I took them back to their dad on Monday, and I received a text from him today saying, Can you please stop manipulating the kids and thinking I'm some evil monster? Am I the jerk for lashing out in this situation? I asked my kids how they would feel about moving with their dad and his girlfriend away from me, and both of them said they didn't want to. Edit. Consulted a lawyer this morning. More context. The reason my ex-husband has the kids on the weekdays is so they can remain in the same school as they used to. School ends on 6-17, then it switches to our summer schedule, where I'll have them on weekdays and he'll have them on the weekends. Not the jerk. These are your kids too, and I can't blame you for reacting like you did. Get a good lawyer, ASAP. Not the jerk. This is what parenting agreements are for. It's great you guys were amicable before, but that time has passed and circumstances changed. Moving your kids far away from you to a rural and isolate place is pretty upsetting for anyone, even if you were still in that marriage. While I understand he may want to give them more of an idyllic outdoor childhood and life, your concerns are totally valid and more realistic. Time to go to court. Maybe they can buy a summer home there. You're the jerk for involving your kids at all. Your anger with their father is not their burden, it's yours. Your reaction was unacceptable. 
If you disagree with his proposal, handle it rationally and under no circumstance should you be bad-mouthing their father to them. If they went home under the impression that he was some kind of monster because you're upset with him, then you messed up. You moved away as well without asking permission, I'm sure. You can keep the same arrangement you have now even if they move three hours away. And for the record, there's a myriad of homeschooling programs out there as well as homeschool communities where kids socialize with other kids every day. And quite honestly, they'll probably get a better education than they would in today's public schools. You went nuclear in your reaction when a rational, civil conversation was possible. You're the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her ex? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for teaching a new student at my ballet class how to break in her point shoes? I, 18 female, am a professional ballet dancer. I attend classes daily six days out of the week. A younger student has recently joined our Saturday morning class. She's 13. I'll be honest, she's a sweet kid, but clearly one of those kids that the parents threw a tutu and shoes at and expected a star. Still though, she seemed determined to make her parents happy, so me and the older members took her under our wing and tried to help her settle in and learn as much as she could. One issue I noticed very quickly was that she couldn't get over her box. Now this could be down to poorly fitted point shoes, in which case there was nothing I could do to help right now, but I asked to see her shoes before she put them on one morning and saw that they weren't adjusted for her or broken in at all, which, ouch, no wonder she couldn't get over the box. So I helped her break them in, and which, I admit, is a rather intense process for people not used to it. One of our walls has dents in it from all the breaking in. I then taught her the basics of customizing them and helped her to get them as comfortable as possible for her. The class went well and she seemed far more comfortable. The following week, her mother came with her to class and went straight to me, demanding to know why I had destroyed her daughter's shoes and didn't I know how expensive those were and how I had better replace them as she couldn't wear them. I admit I was a little dumbfounded by this and just stared at her for a bit before getting annoyed and telling her that we all break in our shoes and it's the only way to do ballet properly. And yes, I know how expensive they are as I go through a pair of shoes each performance. I told her that she clearly knew nothing about ballet as having unbroken in shoes was going to destroy her daughter's feet and make dancing nearly impossible. And if she was serious about it, then she has to understand that it's an expensive investment. Our ballet master then came over demanding to know what all the noise was about. This mother then said I had ruined her daughter's shoes and how she couldn't afford to buy a new set right now and they had needed to last her daughter at least six months, which good luck with that. They asked to see the shoes and laughed and tried to reassure her that they weren't destroyed, just broken in and showed the how and why this was done. She got embarrassed and upset at this before storming off saying our class was a joke and how we were trying to sabotage her daughter. I keep thinking about the kid's face and how mortified and upset she had been. Our ballet master insists I did nothing wrong and it was a lesson she should know at 13 if she's serious about dancing. I wonder if she'll come back on Saturday, but I doubt it based on her mother's reaction. Maybe I would have been better pulling her mother to the side after a class and explaining what her daughter needed rather than how I did it. You're the jerk. I'm sure I'll get downvoted. My kid is 14 and a ballerina. She is a junior company member and dances at two studios five to six days a week. She has never, ever had to beat up a pair of point shoes. For reference, she will be the silver fairy in our Sleeping Beauty variation this weekend show. None of our company members have. The only time that needs to be done is when you need a new pair of shoes for a performance. You shouldn't have touched her shoes like that. Stepping on the box to soften it a bit, yes, but beating on a wall wasn't necessary. Also, there are professional ballerinas who have been dancing for 20 plus years who have never done what you've done to a shoe. If the shank needs to be bent, it should be warmed up with your hands and then put on the foot and bend it. These ridiculous things young dancers do to their shoes are unnecessary. Ripping them open, taking out nails, cutting them, shoe hacks, shaking my head. Edit to add, we work with a master point shoe fitter. You're the jerk. Poor kid either needs some better classes or better fitted shoes because not getting on the box is not solved by breaking them in. Either she's not strong enough and needs more pre-point or those shoes were fitted horrendously. Also, first point shoes could easily last over six months if she's new to it and only doing an hour a week max of bar work. Very minimal in the center, I hope. You need to learn that breaking shoes is very personal and although you might have been trying to be a big sister and helpful, it has potentially stripped the shoes of their strength that she needed for initial support. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the kid's mom? Please let us know.
I bet that place is crawling with Karens when it's time to pick the kids up. We can only get one hotel room now? Okay. Many years ago, I used to work for a company that did a lot of traveling. We're talking 12 to 20 hours a day in a truck with another guy, often for 5 to 10 days at a time. When we stopped at hotels, which was not every night, sometimes you slept in the truck, we would get separate hotel rooms so you would have a little bit of personal space. There was a per diem rate, and as long as we kept the hotel rooms under that rate, it never was an issue. Well, after about 15 years of this, the company suddenly decided that separate rooms was costing too much money. We had to share rooms now, regardless of the cost. The job market was fairly good at this point in time, and a few guys basically quit on the spot, and the rest complained a lot. Now, this actually created two forms of malicious compliance. The first one is, instead of looking for a moderately priced hotel, often the drivers would max out the accepted rate. For example, often we would drive out of major cities and stay in the suburbs where hotels and motels were cheaper. Not anymore. You'd find the really nice hotel downtown, and you'd have to pay for parking down there too for the truck, so you expense that also. Then some guys took this policy a step further and would walk into a hotel and say, I'll give you the max rate for this room. They would chat up the hotel desk, explain the situation, and deliberately overpay for the room, spending every cent they could underneath the max rate just to cost the company a bit more money. The second bit of malicious compliance took a bit more conniving behind the scenes. Shortly after this change was made, it just so happened that the head manager of the company needed to head out on one of these trips, which was a relative rarity. Through the backdoor dealings, a few of us managed to get the most obnoxious, smelliest driver on the schedule with him. This guy was a bit of a trip. Nice guy, but didn't like to shower very often. Talk your ear off and refused to turn on the radio. Was really pretty unkempt and liked to watch certain things really loud on the TV in the hotel room. Wasn't the brightest bulb either, but was relatively competent at his job and easygoing otherwise. After sharing a hotel room with him for one night, the manager decided he needed his own hotel room. We made sure everyone in the company knew the manager could not even hack it for more than one day sharing a room, and this caused some pretty strong strife. A few more good guys quit. Shortly thereafter, they reinstated the policy of individual hotel rooms. But now the damage had been done. Some of the guys really liked staying downtown, so the parking fees for the trucks went up, and the overall cost of the hotel rooms went up too. Am I the jerk for bringing my baby to a child-free wedding? Ah, oh, here we go. My cousin lives a six-hour drive from me and the rest of our family. A few months ago, we all drove over there for his wedding. Due to limited space, no kids were invited to the wedding except the bride's young nieces and nephews. My baby was 10 months old at the time, and I wasn't comfortable leaving him alone in an unfamiliar place with a stranger, which was a babysitter that my other cousins hired for their own kids. So I decided to bring him to the wedding. I wrote on the RSVP that I would be bringing him, but he would be sitting on my lap and I would bring my own food for him. My cousin didn't say anything, so I assumed that he was okay with it. My baby cried at the ceremony, but I quickly took him out of the room. At the reception, I had him with me the whole time in a body carrier. He didn't make much of a fuss and I thought everything was okay. After the wedding, my aunt, groom's mom, confronted me and told me that I was rude for bringing my baby without permission. I explained that I wrote on the RSVP what I was planning to do, but my cousin didn't object. She said that my cousin and his bride had a problem with it, but the bride didn't want to start any drama because she doesn't know me well. My other cousin's baby was 7 months old at the time, and my aunt said that he had no problem leaving his baby with the certified babysitter, and I should have done the same. And some of my cousins were upset because they thought that the groom gave me special treatment by letting me bring my baby and making them leave their kids with a babysitter. I didn't mean to start any drama. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Your baby literally did the thing that the bride and groom wanted to avoid, disrupt the ceremony. You had plenty of time to find a babysitter or other family member to watch your kid while you went to the wedding, but decided that you were just above the rules. Or if you're really not comfortable leaving your baby with a sitter, just don't go to the wedding. Staying home is also an option. No, you don't understand. OP's presence is such a gift that no one minds that her baby interrupted the ceremony. People like you get on my nerves. Child-free means child-free. You do not get to change the rules of someone's wedding because you didn't want to get a babysitter. It's very entitled. You're the jerk. PSA for guests who don't understand how hotels work. A couple of nights ago, I had a late call from a lady and partner who were traveling across the Midwest states by car. They seriously underestimated the distance between towns and cities 
and after a long day of driving called my hotel to ask about availability. Because it was after 2 a.m., I, with great trepidation, quoted the rates and carefully explained that the rooms would be theirs until 11 a.m. today, so about eight hours. At this point, I moved the phone slightly away from my ear and mentally prepared for the wailing and gnashing of teeth to come, but it didn't. Very nice lady said, that's okay, we just need a couple hours of sleep. It's our fault for not planning our route better. I experienced shock and awe, no screaming fits, no yelling, not even the vaguest suggestion of wanting to call a manager. They arrived about 10 minutes later, walked in with smiling faces, something seldom seen in this circumstance, ID and credit card in hand. I took a moment to decide that, no, this was not me having a stroke or a fever dream. These people were actually real. I immediately upgraded them to the nicest available room, gave them a 15% discount off the price of the standard room and quietly mentioned that I might have forgotten to lock the pool and hot tub area and that for the next few hours I would be far too busy to monitor the pool area cameras. Nice lady's eyes widened as she signed the card saying, but this says we're in a family suite and it's less money than you quoted on the phone. I simply smiled, handed her the key, and asked if she needed extra towels as the pool towels had been taken away to laundry so there weren't any available in the pool area. Now the PSA. If you ask politely, communicate what type of room you want, calmly provide us with any special requests, high floor, ADA, pet room, or whatever you think you want or need without making us beg repeatedly for this info, if you ask instead of demanding, if you refrain from shouting, stomping your feet, or otherwise being a total jerk, if you provide your payment method and ID without us having to forcibly wrestle you to the ground and pry your wallet out of your cold hand, if you refrain from asking the NA if you woke them up, no, you did not wake us up, but you most assuredly upset us. If you follow my recommendations, then you will soon discover the amazing magical powers that all front desk associates wield and double that for the mighty powers of the night audit person. Basically, don't be a jerk and we won't treat you like a jerk. One last thing, Hotel days are not the same as calendar days. For explanation, see the thousands of other posts on this sub explaining about rolling the date and check-in and check-out times. Lock your ID away? As you wish. I'm a low runner at a supermarket that's known for not bagging your groceries for you. Due to reasons, I'm almost always on the till, so I'm experienced when it comes to the stupidity that is very common in my store's area. One thing I often do is offer customers a special trolley to help transport heavy and bulky items to and from their cars. These trolleys require the customer to temporarily hand over an ID card to the cashier as insurance so they have to bring these relatively expensive trolleys back. Enter Karen. I don't even remember what she was buying, maybe an outside lounge or something of that like, but she was upset that I'd be taking her driver's license for 10 minutes. As I do for all customers, I tried to assure her that it would be on my person, at this one register, waiting eagerly for her return from downstairs. Nope, not good enough. She demanded I locked it safely away inside the cash drawer. And that's when I realized I had a Reddit story on my hands. With a smile, I showed her as I placed her ID safely nestled among the cash bills in my personal password-protected till. You know, the one that is physically impossible to open mid-transaction? Oh, did I mention that each transaction at this time of day took about 5 minutes at least? Lo and behold, Madam Karen returns with the fabled trolley, safe and sound. Unfortunately for her, I had just started a big sale. When she came to me, palm extended and ready to receive her favorite plastic card, I took the time to pause my scanning, turn to her with full attention and explain to her that she would have to wait until I finished serving my current customer until she could get her precious card back. Honestly, looking back, I'm not sure who is more upset, Karen or the 12 people in my line who witnessed me stop doing my job just to reassure her that I was, in fact, doing my job as she specified. Regardless, Karen took note and let me finish the sale. I took extra care with this one to make sure no products fell over or got even the slightest bit wrinkled as I rung them up. Time consuming, yes, but isn't a job well done worth it? Am I the jerk for installing a lock on my bedroom door? I'm a college student living with my parents for the summer. Typically, I live in my own on-campus apartment, but my university closed my apartment building for sanitary reasons. I've been living here since early May and contribute. I pay a third of the rent and utilities while I also pick up the chores I used to do. One of my biggest problems living here so far is privacy. Growing up, I had no privacy from my dad. He believes since he pays the bills, he has free access to anywhere in the house. Growing up, he never knocked 
would come into the bedroom while I was in it, just never let me feel any semblance of privacy. I've talked to him many times about it, but he's been refusing. The compromise we reached is that he would knock to tell me he's coming in, so he'll knock, then immediately throw the door open. I cannot stand this, so I decided that I would do something about it. My door has never been able to lock. My dad took it out when we moved to this house maybe eight years ago. I fixed this. I found a way to change the door handle and fix the locking mechanism for my door. The next time he tried to come in, he knocked twice, then immediately tried to open the door, but he couldn't. I could hear him messing around with the handle before him asking if the door was locked. I told him I fixed the lock on the door. He started yelling at me through the door. Typical parent crap. I'm letting you live here. This is my house, and you do not lock doors in my house. This led to a massive argument through the door. The next time when I came home from work, my door is completely off the hinges. So now I have literally no privacy in my room. My mom and older sister both said I should have just learned to live with this as it's his house. Am I the jerk? Holy cow, not the jerk. I would stop giving them money. You pay rent. Of course you have a right to lock your door. If possible, find a different place to stay. Unrelated, everyone deserves privacy, no matter how old or how much rent you pay. My oldest is four years old, and I always ask nicely if she's okay with me entering the room. Of course she doesn't have a lock yet for safety reasons, but she is free to close her door and tell me not to enter if she wants to be alone. Not the jerk. If you're paying rent, you're paying for your space, and thus paying for your privacy. Landlords can't just let themselves in whenever they feel like it, even though you're renting their space. I don't know how your home situation is, but it doesn't sound great. And part of me says, stop paying since he won't treat you like an adult. And the other part of me says, just keep your head down until you can move out. But privacy is not something to be earned. Your dad sounds like a controlling jerk, and I'm sorry that you have to live like that. Not the jerk. Your father is unhinged. Every single person, adult or a kid, requires some semblance of privacy. Your father is using his rule as a way to exert control over you, and this is disgusting. Try and get out of there as soon as you can. Even an apartment you can share with other people and pay for your room. You really don't want to live like this. When you do get your own place, have rules for your father. See how he likes it in your home. Furious guest demands to know why we charged his card for room damage. Duh. I work at a Motel 6, which is franchised and owned by a guy who owns around 75% of Motel 6s in our state, as well as Purple Roof Inn in this state and several neighboring states. He also owns a bunch of Super 7s as well, and our policy is to take credit cards and cash without a security deposit. Well, that might change after this, and I hope so. That policy is insane. I don't know how you can own that many hotels and not realize what a disaster policy it is to not take a security deposit with cash payments, especially considering the brands he owns. So for the past week or so, we've had some sketchy people check into a variety of rooms on various days. We still have our lockdown policies in place concerning the number of people per room. For our two bedrooms, it's four people, exception for families and their kids. Also, housekeepers will not enter stayover rooms so we have linens, towels, etc. at the desk. So in this particular room, I've noticed that it's been having heavy traffic. For our area, that usually means crime. I keep an eye on that room throughout the week and notice that there are five other rooms that the people in that room seem to be familiar with. Like, I'd see them meeting in the parking lot, exchanging packages, and going in and out of each other's rooms, etc. So I inform my GM and the other shifts and I keep my eyes on those rooms through the week. They aren't doing anything overt and are generally staying within our rooms except for a noise complaint here and there. About two days before they checked out, I noticed an increase in people on bikes coming and going from those rooms with backpacks, so I'm certain that crime is involved. But as I said, they were keeping within our rules and we've been pretty lax about occupancy cap, but not for like party rooms with 10 people. So I just note what's happening. So they check out in mass and I come in that day and my boss is fuming. She says the main room that I initially took notice of broke the toilet. I thought, oh, okay, probably the handle or maybe the toilet seat. But no, they broke the entire toilet in half. How? I do not know. The toilet tank cover was shattered in the shower. Again, I do not know how. Their headboards were busted off the wall and the water leaked into three adjoining rooms, not occupied, and caused damage. 
She then said that two of the other rooms were tattooing and spilled ink all over the floor and on the beds. So now those linens are trash and we cannot rent those rooms out until the flooring is replaced. One of the rooms had hair dye all over it, on the beds and the towels, so those are trash now. And the rooms were trashed, like multiple days of food containers stacked around the trash can trashed, so those rooms cannot be rented until we can clean and air them out. And of course, they smoked in all of them. My boss called the owner and he blew up on her, asking her why were we renting to people like that, like we can tell. He asked if she got payment for the damage and of course she didn't because they paid cash. He flipped out and she reminded him of his policy, which sort of shut him up. I walked in just as she was hanging up. So I checked the guy's stay history and he did have a card on file for one of those days. So my boss told me to run it for $500 and surprisingly it went through. So that cheered her up a bit. So a bit later on in my shift, the guy calls me screaming and asking why we charged his card. I calmly explained it was for room damages and he screams, what damages? Like really? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. I say the documented damage from the room that we're reporting to the police as well, and that shuts him up. He hung up on me and he hasn't called back. Of course, we didn't report anything to the police, but we did document everything. The next day, one of the people from those rooms tried to check back in, and my boss was like, nope, but pretended to get their ID for DNR. Needless to say, all those rooms are also PERMA-DNR. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.